Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer, and my guest today is Harry Alto for his second interview. Um, did the first one a few months ago, and if you haven't watched it, you might even want to watch that one before watching this one. Um, we, we received a very nice response to Harry's first interview, both Harry and me. Um, he got maybe 600 emails from various people, some of whom he's still in communication with, and I got all sorts of comments like, cancel everybody else and just interview Harry every week. Um, <laughs> so and some people really resonated with that interview. And uh, I'm going to start with a, a lot of questions that people sent in to Harry uh, on the basis of that interview. And then there's some other sections we're going to uh, cover in the course of this interview. Might be a long one. So I'm just going to start asking these in the order they appear. Okay. And well, here I am again. Yeah, here you are. Again. <laughs> I don't know how you did that uh, again, but here I am. And thank well, you, you for like, having me. You liked the first one. <laughs> I did. I was yeah. very appreciative. Yeah, Let me just say a few words. You know, um, yeah. I was actually quite um, intrigued and surprised by the response. Mm -hmm. um, you know, getting hundreds of people emailing you isn't my normal existence, and you know, and I try to answer the questions and inquiries and so forth as best I could. I didn't get to them all, but I got to a lot of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I was also surprised by the depth of the, uh, you know, depth of some of the questions. Yeah. They're, they were very, they were profound, mostly appreciative, but not always. Mm -hmm. And and they were, they were deep. They were, they were good questions, and we're going to try to cover some of them today. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> and you also had people, uh, wanting to come to Fairfield to see you and wanting you to go and teach retreats in various places and so on, which you don't do as of yet. But uh, it was interesting that that got stirred up. <clears throat> so uh, I'm just going to take these in order. It's uh, somewhat random, but uh, I, I'm sure that a lot of nice material will emerge as we go on. So here's the first question. What is the difference between no self and all self? Well, you know, my main, uh, if I have a main, a story to tell or an experience to relate or an understanding to communicate it's that uh, the growth of consciousness is inclusive and not exclusive and you know there are there are movements you know I there's there's pure consciousness fundamental it, everybody has it some people are aware of it some people aren't and that pure consciousness can be seen as empty or it can be seen as full um, it's been my experience that as a younger person, in my experience, there wasn't much there, but it was there. 24 hours a day, always there. That's called uh, uh, awakening, right? The first stage of awakening to me is that stage where there, you see this uh, primordial consciousness that's universal, right? And then uh, my experience was that that, that consciousness grew with um, as it became brighter, fuller, richer, it wasn't so dark, wasn't so small. Um, it was. Uh, it started revealing its true nature, and the true nature of the relative and the subtle relative. That's what I'd say about that. Do mm. you have a question on that? No, but it, it reminded me of something I wanted to say, which is that in the last interview I introduced you as being possibly the most articulate person I had interviewed. And I objected to that, yes. Yeah, and afterwards I thought, no, articulate isn't the right word. I've, I've interviewed plenty of people who are incredibly articulate. Yes. You know, they're experienced Very teachers, intellectual, very sequential. Writers. Yes. Yeah. Yes. But um, I thought of a metaphor to ex perhaps distinguish you from a lot of the people out there, which is that, you know, most of the people in the world think that I am a wave, and I see myself as separate from all these other waves. And then teachers come along and say, you're not a wave, you're the ocean. And, and some people realize that experientially, oh yeah, I'm the ocean. And then other teachers, I'd say a little bit more nuanced, say, you're, you are the ocean, but you're also the wave, you're both, you know, individuality and universality. Now what you're saying is, okay, yeah, you're the wave and the ocean, but look, within the ocean, there's all kinds of detail. There's fish and whales and seaweed and crabs and all kinds of stuff going on within the ocean. And you don't hear too many people, I'm obviously using a metaphor here, but you don't hear too many people out there in the spiritual circuit talking that way about the fine fabrics or the fine details within the unmanifest, within consciousness. And I think that's an area in which you are extremely articulate 
well, there's the word I think. In that respect, you are articulate. You know, you, you can say a lot about that stuff. Well, look, I, I'd like to add here that <clears throat> none of these fish or whales or squid, whatever, swimming around <laughs> in the ocean, uh -huh. eliminate the ocean. The ocean I experience just like many, many people do. It's an unbounded field of consciousness. It isn't disturbed by anything. It's there. It's always there. And perhaps in my last interview, you might have, uh, you know, thought that I was only talking about the structure or the, uh, or the details of it, but I'm, I'm not. I'm talking about the whole phenomenon. The ocean will never be anything other than an ocean. What's in the ocean, and you know, some people think there's nothing in the ocean. <clears throat> And that's true on one level. There's nothing in the ocean. If you talk about the absolute, pure, unbounded silence, it's pure, unbounded silence. In my experience, there's an experiencer to that silence. And when, it's, when there's an experience of somebody saying, well, I, I have this experience, that experience is already something. It's some fluctuation, however silent. So I'd like to make that point. The ocean is always there. I recognize if somebody has the ocean, that's the fundamental first and most important experience of, of wakefulness is being aware of that ocean of consciousness. Absolutely. Yeah. And we'll get into the questions about yeah. this later, but some would say if you're if you're kind of getting hung up on all the details of you know angels and subtle beings and subtle levels and all kinds of stuff that's going on, which is what we're referring to when we talk about fish within the ocean, you know the, yes. the subtle mechanics of creation, then you're kind of regressing because you're getting caught up in stuff which ultimately is Maya, ultimately is illusory. You know, you should if you're really settled in enlightenment, then you don't care about all that stuff. You're just down to the foundation bedrock of creation, and you reside there mm -hmm. with without any... Yes, but yeah. nobody's talking that that ocean goes away. Right. The point is that the ocean is there along with all this other stuff. Mm -hmm. The point is that you're not sitting there like Buddha with a big belly. <laughs> you're also with eyes open having the same experience. Mm. The same experience of that unbounded ocean of consciousness along with everything else. Um, a person who uh, has a fully developed consciousness doesn't suddenly not see the daily relative. Drives a car, stops at a red light, doesn't drive through the red light, stops because that's the thing to do, right? Yeah. Self-preservation is still lively. Now, pure consciousness, if you look at it from just the level of pure consciousness itself, you could say that, you know, I, I said this analogy last time, when it's clear, when it's full, it's like a it starts like a flashlight and ends up like a floodlight and then turns into an illuminated field of consciousness that that shines on everything and gives it its full value. It doesn't go anywhere. It's always there. I, I, I acknowledge the fact that all the non-dualists and the Advaitis have something very significant in their consciousness, pure consciousness. It's great. That's wonderful. My experience was that that pure consciousness is, is just like what I've said. It's a light that illuminates uh, whatever comes into its proximity. It doesn't eliminate it. Uh, a person... Um, Does pure consciousness have a proximity? Isn't it... I said whatever everywhere? comes into it. That's a figure of speech. Okay, okay. Pure consciousness is everywhere, yeah. but so is the fluctuations of pure consciousness, the subtle relative, and even the gross relative. It's everywhere. Mm -hmm. It's a universe. Yeah. It's all one continuum. Mm -hmm. And yes, it's all one level of consciousness seen by people who are traveling towards it, as it were now. Some, somebody might say there's no path. And ultimately, if you want to put it, look at it holistically, there is no path. On the other hand, we all are moving towards something. If if um, <clears throat> if somebody wants to eat something, they have to go to the grocery store and they go buy it. It doesn't matter if you have pure consciousness or don't have pure consciousness. You have to go to the grocery store to get the food. Mm -hmm. We call that a journey. Consciousness is like that, right? It's you you moving towards the recognize recognizing something that's already there, right? I that's true. Mm -hmm. That's been my life. Um, there's always that 
there's always that sense when there's a new experience or a new level that it's always been there. There's always that feeling there. Now, the only thing that my experience has been that every time uh, I, I see something, say it's a le celestial level, as long as that celestial level or the devas or gods or goddesses, whatever you see, doesn't obscure the pure consciousness, it's a valid, good experience. If all you see is the subtle relative, then that's not good. That's like being lost in the gross relative, same mm -hmm. thing. It's all in reference to the self, in reference to the wholeness of the experience, mm -hmm. right? Okay. All right, let's go on. What do you feel is the main benefit of self-realization? In my case, it's a, a sense of contentment that comes from the knowing. It's, you know, it's a very simple analogy. You know, the let's say somebody has the world's most valuable ruby, but it's still rough cut. It does. Maybe they, they don't even know what it is, so they have no value. They got they own the ruby. It's worth millions of dollars, but they don't know what it is. What value is that? Some expert. A ge uh, geologist, gemologist. gemologist comes along, comes into the house, looks at this raw stone, says, whoa, do you know that that's a very valuable ruby? No, I didn't know that. I've had that for generations. Suddenly that knowledge, what does that knowledge do that? That person is very ecstatic. <laughs> His life has been transformed, mm. right? That's a very common analogy, but it's very true. So, so what I'm saying is that is that the understanding of the reality of your own experience, the understanding that there is this field of consciousness that can illuminate the gross relative, the subtle relative, everything in your life can enhance it. That knowledge alone is worth having wakefulness for. It's quite apart from the fact that it makes you happier. <laughs> Can one person help wake another person up? Well, I kept, I had a lot of people say, help, help, you know, give, yeah. can, can you do something for me? And in the same way that I'm, you know, we're talking about understanding and knowledge, how understanding enhances experience that's already universally available, yes, understanding can help, but everybody, everybody's different, right? And, and people ask me, so, so if you're having all those experiences, why don't you, you know, uh, change the world? Why don't you enlighten this person? Why don't you do this? Um, think about it for a second. If there was such a human being on earth who could, let's say, let's say you could enlighten me, that would upset the entire fabric of creation. All, it, it would probably, what? If there was a healer on earth who could heal everybody, that'd be the end of civilization as we know it. Everybody would get healed. And it'd be lines up going around the world to see this person. But that's not how it is. We have our own lives to live. Now, miracles, as far as I can see, are fortuitous events that happen at the right time to the right person. They don't happen randomly. I can't suddenly say, hey, Rick, you're awake. Are you? <laughs> and you say, oh, thank you, Harry. That's wonderful. But nobody has had that. The, the rishis, the gurus, the greatest people on earth haven't had that ability. Yeah, but um, okay. there are, are a great many famous and some not so famous people who seem to have a knack for uh, being catalysts to others' awakenings. You know, many people awoke in the presence of Ramana or Papaji or some of the contemporary teachers, Adya Shanti, Pamela Wilson, you know, various people um, have a pretty good track record in terms of catalyzing or facilitating uh, spiritual awakenings among those who come to yes, see them. Yes, I agree with that. Yeah. Let's, let, uh, pure consciousness is universal. It's in, around, through everybody. You can't, it's there. Some people are aware of it, some people. So, so let's say a person comes along who actually has this experience and he begins to describe it. Let's say you're close to that experience, but you don't know what it is. It's there, you know, you, you don't know it's there, but it's there. So the, the right person comes along at the right moment and starts describing it to you. So suddenly the, the, uh, the jewel, the, the 
that was that's in the rough stone is described to you as as what it really is yes you can oh yeah I get it I get it mm -hmm. that can happen of course and it does but when you talk in terms of description that has more of an intellectual connotation you know you're clarifying somebody's intellectual understanding but how about the transmission quality you know but that, that's that what you I'm saying from and an awake person does does not talk intellectually mm -hmm. he talks he may. He might give lectures and talks. Yes, but it's not intellectual. If, he, if, if the person is awakened, he speaks from his the, experience. From his experience. Right. So. And so what, what I'm saying, in terms of what he can convey to others and how he can convey it, he can use words. But you know, a lot of teachers say, well, it's my silence which is the real teacher here. My words are just sort of filler. And what, if you're getting anything from me, it's because of sitting in my presence. And there's a kind of a, a contagiousness to uh, the sitting in the presence of an enlightened person, a transmission, which is supposed to be conducive to awakening. If a person is awake, his speech is the speech of enlightenment. Mm -hmm. It's not just a transmission of an emanation. His speech is the same. Speeches um, can convey the subtleties of of pure consciousness of awakening to somebody else mm -hmm. of course um, but if that person isn't in the right uh, at the right time in the right moment otherwise a, a teacher like that could enlighten everybody they can't well yeah I mean obviously they can't have s seven billion people in their immediate presence or even and, ten and even if or if they and if they have ten let's say those ten are going to be at varying degrees of receptivity that's my point yeah yes uh, well like Amma used the example of um, you know a, bur a log that's burning brightly can kind of ignite other logs if they come close to it and you know maybe one log is dry and ready to burn another log is kind of waterlogged and soggy and it's not gonna ignite very easily but you know if a log has the readiness to burn it's there's a greater likelihood of it igniting in the in the immediate presence of an awakened person than if it's you know just off someplace without a, without such a person to to sit with i do have trouble with uh, um saying that all you have to do is sit near a person and that person will get okay that's yeah that's a little bit far fetched and most of those me. teachers don't say that either they, that's right you know they some don't. of them say well you you know i can only do so much you yeah <laughs> you <gotta> yeah. <laughs> yeah you gotta do something you yeah. gotta practice do do some meditation you have to be ready for it i mean you can, yeah okay yeah i think we're in agreement on that okay okie dokie um how is it possible to be eternal or experience infinity since everything seems to be ending. You know, that brings up the whole thing of the, the ever-changing relative. You know, our daily lives seem to be nothing but a series of events that begin, go somewhere and end. Mm -hmm. Like that's relative life. The universe fun seems to function that way, right? There's a beginning, a middle, and an end. Now, <clears throat> and then this whole concept that many uh, organizations or spiritual movements talk about that it's all an illusion it's all why go there and in terms of a person who doesn't have pure consciousness, I totally agree if you don't have the uh, pure consciousness established 24 hours a day then the relative appears to be not worth much you you can become afraid of it because it's always ending and at the end of your life you're gone it's over now a person who wakes up has the experience that <clears throat> At first, there's a separation that takes place, you know, in some organizations it's called cosmic consciousness. There's a big separation. Pure consciousness is, is separate from your activity, separate from your senses, your body, your environment, your friends, the world. It's just separate. It's just there. You don't really know what it is. It's just there. It's self-awareness itself. It knows itself, but whoever you are doesn't know it. Okay, so from that point of view, it looks like an illusion. It, it feels like an illusion. Now, the world does. The world does, yes. The relative life seems like it's an, you know, a waste of time. Mm -hmm. Now, as that separation becomes less and less, let's say, let's say pure coin, just say it's here, and let's say um, the rest of life is here, and it gets closer and closer and closer, call this a light. Call pure consciousness a light. It begins to, you, 
begin to recognize this is the kind of view here and it gets bigger and bigger this doesn't really not this is not really happening because it's already happened you're already one state of consciousness but you're realizing that and as you realize uh, the fundamental uh, experience of pure consciousness it it begins to unite everything on the understanding deep deep understanding level first okay there's a growth of consciousness in terms of the illumination or the or the or the expansion of the self the expansion of the self means that uh, the changing value of the relative begins to be known in its non-changing value there's a non-changing value you know, remember, mm -hmm. the pure consciousness is everywhere. Right. It's not just here, it's everywhere. Now, the trick is that, or what certainly has happened to me and certainly has been my experience, that neither of the, neither the experience of pure consciousness or the experience of, of daily life relativity, neither of them actually change in any way. The absolute doesn't turn non-absolute. The relative doesn't turn uh, non-relative. It continues to appear to change. The illusion is that there's the appearance of change. It's an illusion. It's an appearance. It doesn't really change. Even the relative doesn't change because it's permeated by pure consciousness. Infinity, the absolute. Now, where I might differ from other people is I would say that even the silence is a, f a field of fluctuating knowingness. It's actually the ground state of, of all relativity. If it's a ground state of all relativity, then the, the relativity is also absolute, is also non-changing, is also eternal. Every single movement in the world, whether it's spiritual or New Age, talks about you can, you can wake up. There's, there's a field of infinite life, eternity, you can experience the absolute. What does that actually mean? It means just that. There is a field of... It's not absolute life for the absolute. Absolute life for some nebulous, huge, unbounded nothingness. It's, it's infinite life for you and for me and for everybody else. If they can realize that... Uh, the, if they have the experience of wakefulness, then ultimately you begin to realize that everything is that including the small self including the senses including the body including your friends environment and all of that is infinite in the end all of that is uh, has infinity as its base value now as long as it's something you don't know then you might as well say you're not you're not you don't have an eternal life you have an eternal life if you know it it's not the absolute that has the eternal life it's something else and my experience I went through maybe a decade where I was looking well there was I had this huge abstract experience and I was looking for well, who's having that experience where is he where's that person somebody's having it is it just unbounded absolute knowing itself because that was my experience it was kind of a unified uh, knowing this, that everything was unbounded, everything, the relative, the subtle relative, gods, angels, everything, all unbounded, pure consciousness. But who was having that experience? Didn't seem to be anybody there, nobody home. That went on for about a decade. And what happened over time, <clears throat> it's hard to put into words, but let, let's try. Um, That unified, abstract experience started turning uh, more concrete, more physical. Somehow, can't tell you how, but my senses began to fun began to function and move within that absolute without coming out. It didn't disturb that absolute consciousness, that absolute fluctuation of wholeness, even the senses did not disturb that and soon as that even I had an inkling of that I said aha that's where the eye is that's where the big eye is the little eye is the middle size all the the knowingness that I've had for all these years actually has a center 
as an experiencer. And, and I, I realized in a flash and had the experience that between, this is his words now, between the absolute and the relative is that, 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 that experiencer that holds them together and holds them apart. Sees the absolute, sees the relative. At that point, when the, when the knower, my knower, your knower, you are a knower, and, and there's a kind of a point value personality there, as well as a universe, all this, it, that knower as if ties the entire experience of togetherness, the, all the layers of creation suddenly say, I am that. They all are that. So that nothing is excluded. The experiencer says, I am pure silence. I'm also pure dynamism. At this point, the, the relative life, daily life, takes on the same quality, even though it remains exactly the same. On the understanding level, sensory level, experiential level, the daily life takes on the same value as the absolute while remaining regular life. No longer seen as an illusion, seen as the full fully glorified aspect of the self, one of the fully glorified aspects of oneness. There is, there is one state of consciousness, I agree with that. But that state of consciousness recognizes and is all the different layers as well. I don't know. This reminds me, um, last couple of weeks I've interviewed a couple of physicists. One was yes. Peter Russell, and he wrote a book called From, what was it, From uh, Science to God. <coughs> And then last week, uh, Bernardo Kastrup, who wrote a book called Why Materialism is Baloney. <laughs> and, uh, and with both of them, the discussion came up about the mechanics of creation. Okay. And, you know, on the one hand, we, you know, we are always saying everything is consciousness. It's all consciousness. And yet, you know, there is how does consciousness become flesh and paper and metal and, and stars and, uh, you know, or does it? I mean, because if you look closely enough, you find that those things are also very insubstantial. You know, it, this appears to be a hand, but if you go down to the subatomic levels, there's, it's just, um, you know, probabilities of energy, you know, and there's really nothing going on. Um, so what are, uh, and Bernardo actually tried to distinguish between, um, inanimate things, such as cups, which there's nothing that it's like to be a cup. A cup has no self-consciousness, and animate things. And we got into a debate about where you draw the line between what's alive and what's not alive, and so on. And he used the analogy that, you know, it's all water, and a whirlpool in water is nothing but water, but it has a sort of an existence as a whirlpool, and it has this sort of self-reflective quality where one side of the whirlpool could reflect the other side of the whirlpool, whereas he, he distinguishes with something like a cup, which has, it's more like a ripple in the water. It hasn't become a whirlpool, so it has no self-reflective quality. So the, the question is, how, if everything is nothing but consciousness, absolute, um, and this is perhaps an eternal question, and the, the great mystics have been baffled by it, you know, the, the, the mysterious nature of Maya. But how is it that, that, you know, consciousness absolute appears to assume form without actually losing its quality as consciousness absolute? Because if it can lose it, if, for, if consciousness can become plastic or metal, then it changes. And if it changes, it's not unchanging. You know, it get converted into something else, so it's relative like everything else. Yeah, that's true. That's um, that's a perennial question, <laughs> right? And and along, I started uh, writing about just that thing. How does the absolute manage to remain absolute um, in the process of becoming the objective world? And I've written a, maybe hundreds of pages of stuff on that. And let me see if I can summarize it with my experience of that. Yes, there is a process. Um, <clears throat> the reason I call experience pure consciousness on its fundamental level, because it's conscious, conscious of itself. I also call it pure intelligence. Intelligence has a quality of intelligence. That intelligence is the is, let's call it, the packets of knowledge that 
have imbibed in them with the seed values of relativity. Now, relativity doesn't have any um, validity on that level because on, on the level of the primary level of pure consciousness, everything is eternal. It's always fluctuating. In Indian terms, it's called the Ved, right? The fluctuations of, of universal consciousness and individual consciousness. Now, those packets or those reverberations of knowledge, how they become, uh, how they objectify from this subjective field of consciousness, how do they become? I'm loath to say this because somebody would accuse me of being a know-it-all, but I see that. I can see how that takes place. I wasn't going to cover it in this meeting. Now Maybe you are. <laughs> well, I'm going, to, I'm going to do a little bit of that. Now, I got to a point in my experience where there was nowhere else for me to go to understand it other than because, of, you know, um, I was looking for how to describe that entire process that I'm experiencing, how pure consciousness becomes this moving consciousness, becomes this subtle relative consciousness, and becomes this uh, gross relatives, as I say. And it doesn't really become that because it's already that. There's the answer. It's already that. Mm -hmm. That's the answer to if a person's consciousness is aware of the subtle, the pure and bounded consciousness, uh, aware of the subtle relative fluctuations of consciousness, intelligence as it's fluctuating, as it's becoming conscious, more objective, and as, as it becomes the, uh, the world of the natural law, or the, let's call it the natural elements, sun, air, water, all those elements of nature that make the body, the sun, the air, all of those things, there's a process that's taking place that's maintaining you. Those are also part of the process. And once you get to that level, it's only one little step into the gross relative. So you've got this continuum of consciousness. It can be seen, it can be known. Now, the ancient Indian rishis, of course, described this in the, in the four primary Vedas. I wasn't going to talk about that, but maybe yeah, talk I will. about anything that comes okay, up. Okay, all right. So they have Rig Veda, Sama Veda, Yajur Veda, and Atarva Veda. Those are the four. Uh, keep in mind, I'm not a Vedic scholar. I've had an experience, and I, I put it into this framework for understanding, because I haven't found it anywhere else. So uh, Rig Veda is described as, uh, there's a word called Sanghita. It's pure consciousness, pure, unbounded consciousness. And that's just how the Rishi is called the Rig Veda. Everything is included in this, in this uh, Rig Veda. Sama Veda is the movement of that consciousness. I see the movement of that consciousness. Um, it's as if part of that, whole, that pure consciousness. It's imbibed in it. It's everywhere. The self-awareness of, of this abstract field of consciousness is called Sama Veda. It's also extremely blissful. But the movement of consciousness is already somewhat physical. It's moving, it's fluctuating, it's doing. And, and there's that word I used last time, you know, soma. Soma vade. The movement of consciousness is, not, is, is one of the aspects of the experience that I have. I see consciousness, I see its movement. You know, some people will immediately say, pure consciousness can't move because it's pure and bounded and movable. I agree. It's pure, unbounded, immovable. Uh, but I also experience a field of consciousness that actually moves along with that. It does not obscure. Neither is obscure. And then there's the, the, then there's the Atarva Ved, which is the subtle relative. And in Indian terms, it's the Devata level. In Christian terms, it would be the heavens and all the angelic beings that the mystics have described. And so it's a continuum. There's this pure consciousness, there's this movement of pure consciousness, then there's the celestial level, the divine level, the subtle relative level, one continuum. Now, uh, you might notice it's going from the abstract to the movement, and that's a little more concrete than the abstract, going towards the movement, going to the subtle relative level. That's more concrete, but it's still divine, not in most people's consciousness. Now, if you're just lost in the field of that, you know, angels and gods, then that's no good. It's no better than being lost in 
relative life, no better than being lost in the absolute, where nothing exists. Okay, so the fourth field of Ved would be the uh, Atarva Ved. That would be a description of, of the relative. Yajur, you haven't mentioned. I think you already mentioned the. Tarva. I'm sorry, Yajur Ved is, is the subtle relative. Right. Yes, and then the Atarva Atarv Ved would be the last. Uh, would it would. Uh, it's it's a description of the, um, let's call it just our daily lives, mm -hmm. universal existence on the gross level. So, in in uh, in Vedic terms, or and which uh, actually relates to my experience very clearly, is that there's these four levels. Mm -hmm. Now they're not independent levels. They're not one, two, three, four. They're one field of consciousness. So I agree with that. There's one consciousness. And for the sake of articulating that one consciousness, for the sake of understanding that, here's the jewel again, okay? Mm -hmm. This jewel has value because it has all this detail, has this wonderful detail, has, it has this unbounded quality, has this movement quality, has this divine quality, and has this relative quality, all of which makes one eternal, unbounded uh, consciousness, which is what eternal life is all about. You can't change that. That's a reality. Everybody will eventually get there. Let me uh, ask the same question in a slightly different way. Um, one thing I kind of ran into with Peter Russell, I think, if I understood We've it. We've only gone through three questions I know. so far. <laughs> so, <yeah. laughs> I brought my pillow and my, uh, my yeah. blankie and my teddy bear. Um, the, the, the quality of intelligence, I mean, um, Long before there were living beings who could have discussions like this, there was an evolving universe, if the Big Bang Theory is yes, correct. Yes. And stars were getting formed, and stars yes, were yes, exploding yeah, and yes. reforming, and heavier elements were getting created. But if there had been anyone there to really examine it closely, they would have seen that uh, all these processes were um, being carried out by very um, profound and precise laws of nature, gravitation and electromagnetic, you know, law, you know, all the laws of nature yes. that physicists currently understand. So it didn't take any kind of, uh, you know, biological life to conduct to understand all that. And even now, you know, things happen in the world without biological intelligence. There's an intelligence governing creation itself. And biological intelligence is just one expression of that. So what fascinates me for some reason is uh, that whole issue of intelligence. Consciousness, the word consciousness has kind of a plain vanilla connotation. It's like this flat, you know, nothingness. But, but it's, far, it's so much more than that, obviously, if we look to the display of it in creation. There's, there's just so, such infinite intelligence in, you know, governing every tiny particle and every vast you know galaxy and everything in between it's one seamless orchestration of of intelligence everything infinitely related and infinitely correlated so how does that kind of relate to your experience of the actual mechanics of what is going on and what what is this intelligence both in its universal value and in terms of its individual agencies it, the expressions of that intelligence which uh, which conduct the manifestation and governance of creation. That's a pretty heavy question. Well, I want a heavy answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, you say, where's the biological uh, component to this um, apparently, you know, mechanical, almost random? No, 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 not random. Okay. Nothing's random. All right. and, 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 and biology is just a, a kind of an offshoot of a much vaster intelligence which exists whether or not there's any kind of biological expressions. You know, wh whether there's human beings or, or newts or anything else, the universe is this sort of beautiful display of intelligence. And you've described to me in, in the past, you know, experiences of deep laws of nature that are actually um, responsible for the, the whole the whole show. Well, that's what I was going to get to is yeah. that that as soon as you say consciousness, as soon as you say intelligence, I immediately have the experience that of um, 
let's call it cosmic biology, <laughs> okay? Let's put the word God in there for a moment. Mm -hmm. And you could take the word absolute and exchange the word, put God there. You know, in this age, we don't talk about God as much. You know, we have more scientists. They like to talk about the absolute and the vacuum state and all these, these things. But I, when I listen to a physicist talk, particularly a, a physicist that's really kind of delving into it, it sounds very much like what I'm experiencing. Now, if I were to describe my experience in terms of uh, light or, or, or or movements of consciousness. I can see the structure, and it looks like all those terms the physicists use. You know, I forget what they are, but you know, quantus of light. Yeah, and there's and all, all force this. fields and matter yeah, fields and, and, and all that. Quarks and leptons and bosons. It and all looks that exactly stuff. like that to me. Right now, if I were to describe my experience to me, I would see pure consciousness, and I see all these these sheets and waves and points of light, they're fluctuating mm -hmm. and they're, they're, they're crossing each other. There's points where they cross, they spiral out. This field of unbounded consciousness, which doesn't move, is immovable on its surface, as it were, surface being everywhere. It's not one dimensional, it's all dimensional. There's this field of fluctuating sheets and waves and points and twirling ricks of light. I can see it, I can see it now. And I see these going into those four fields that I talked about. They bifurcate, as it were, they get more and more complex, but the complexity becomes more and simpler and simpler because all these little points and fluctuations, they make a wholeness. It's like your body, you know. It's a kind of a simple, on one level it's a simple unit. We're all the same. We're running around doing what we do. We're a body. It's infinitely complex, yet we're still just, you know, I see a guy walking, well, how, how simple is that? Or whatever, right? It's one body. In the same way, this pure consciousness looks to me like a cosmic body, like God. Mm -hmm. How can I say that? And in some way, little old me, little old you, were related to that. That I don't want to use the word entity, but let's let's say just God. Let's just use the word God. We're related to God, and. Tom Trainer used to like to say, sense organs of the infinite. You could say that. Uh -huh. In a sense, you'd say the, the, the elements of nature are the functioning of the sense organs of God. Let's, you know, yeah, that's one way of talking. Yeah. One way of talking about it, right? So, uh, what we're saying, describing this absolute experience and those four levels that I talk about, they're not levels independent of each other. It's one continuum of consciousness. So when you're seeing all these streams and points of light intersecting and doing all this stuff, it's not like just some kind of... It's not random. It's not just, random and no. it's not some kind of meaningless visual hallucination. You say you're actually... Some people might say that. <laughs> that might say, yeah. But uh, you're saying that you're actually... that those are actually the mechanics of perception I mean, excuse me, the mechanics of creation that your perception is allowing you to ap to apprehend to whatever degree. Maybe it's not 100% complete. Maybe there's even more going yeah, on. Yeah, I'm sure there but is. But you're, you're kind of tuning into something that is sort of uh, integral to the manifestation of the universe on, on an actual visual level. Yes, and it's undeniable to me personally because my daily life is not disconnected from that uh, subtle relative. Mm -hmm. The subtle relative is not disconnected from, from this absolute field of pure silence. They're, they're there simultaneously. I can't deny that they're there. And it's not just a, it's not just a knowingness. It's a visual, auditory, sensory, uh, I can literally uh, taste it even. All the senses are part of that. That's why I like the word wholeness, and I know that it might be hard to understand, but how can you... Imagine if, you, if your inner experience is not inner experience, it's actually inner to outer experience, and that inner to outer experience includes pure consciousness, the subtle relative, and the gross form, all as one continuum. Then, then the knowledge 
dawns on you that what isn't absolute? What isn't absolute? Nothing in this, this fluctuating field or this beautiful field uh, eliminates pure consciousness. Pure consciousness does not eliminate those subtle fields, nor the so-called gross relative, which has ceased to be gross, as has now become fully, it's found itself in its full value. And the full value of the relative is the full value of the subtle relative. The full value of the subtle relative is the full value of the absolute. And I, here, you, I loved your analogy at the beginning, you know, you know, describing the ocean. the ocean. Yes, you got all these things swimming in the ocean. The ocean is not disturbed in any way by all this stuff. And they're not distractions to the wholeness. Quite on, quite on the contrary, what I found, my experience of evolved over 40 years. It didn't happen overnight. Every time I had a new experience, and maybe I'd get lost in it for a little while, I'd say, oh, this is so beautiful, this is glorious, whoa, man. But it, it was like a puzzle, another puzzle piece. And, and what happens when you see a puzzle piece put into a puzzle? You see a bigger area, right? So it reveals more of the puzzle. The, you see more of the scene. What, or whatever the puzzle is, and then you, there's five pieces missing there, and you suddenly have this experience, or you find the puzzle piece, put them there, what happened? Or suddenly there's a panorama. So in a sense, all of this, after a certain point of um, clarity of consciousness, everything that happens expands the field of unboundedness, and of course it's already unbounded. But since my physiology and my senses and my body is only having a certain amount of that, it can keep growing. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, um, how, to, how to put that. Well, like you were saying at the very beginning, um, you know, the infinite is, is already infinite, has always been infinite, unboundedness is always, but it's a matter of how much we can appreciate it. And you don't necessarily go from A to Z in one yeah. you know, second. That's right. It's a, it's a, you know, Progressive, yes, yes, growth, yes, yes, and yes, there's yes. always more to appreciate. Yes, you, let's let's take a few more questions since, <laughs> so I don't get a million questions. Why didn't you answer my question? Okay, all right. Um, I think we may have answered this one. What is this illusion that everyone talks about? Yeah, let's about? let's Skip leave that, that one alone. Yeah, um, and I think maybe the next one describe what it means to be awake to pure consciousness. I think you've already done We've that. We've done that. Yeah. Okay, well, let, but this, let's touch on this one just a little bit more. Okay. Why do you always talk of subtle layers? Are they okay. not just another form of illusion? Yes. And they are another form of illusion if that's all you're experiencing. Yeah. In, so other, in other words, if you're hung if, up in them. If you're hung up in a celestial or some, mm -hmm. uh, or some angel or god or something, and all you have is that experience, mm -hmm. or, or or you have some psychic power or you, whatever, and that's what you have. Pure consciousness is not there, but this, this wonderful or not so wonderful experience is there. If you're lost in that experience to the exclusion of pure consciousness, yes, that's, that would be the same as, as being, uh, what, running around the relative and not knowing the, uh, not having that experience of pure consciousness. Same thing on the subtle level. And it seems that by the same token you can get lost in the absolute. Uh, and there's a, there's a phrase in the Upanishads which says, into blinding darkness go those who worship, uh, how's it go? Into blinding darkness go those who, you know, worship the relative. Even e into even greater darkness go those who worship the absolute. You know, uh, it uses slightly different terms, but it's almost like if you become sort of a, a fundamentalist uh, of of the absolute, dismissing all the relative implications and levels of experience. There's, you know, that is just as incomplete as the or people as what people ordinarily do, being hung up in the relative and uh, unaware of the absolute. If that, if I'm interpreting that verse correctly. And everybody has to realize he said that, not me. <laughs> no, but you have to give full glory to the absolute, right? Mm -hmm. Because fundam that's the fundamental experience of wakefulness is 24 hours a day pure consciousness. Okay, I'll just go through this one more time. And I do agree with you in principle, but 
I would never put down the absolute because that's where my experience started mm -hmm. and, and still there. That has never changed. Um, pure unbounded consciousness is a field that starts small, it's little, you know, you, it, it may, maybe of it it's taste a flavors, it. taste, maybe a kid kind of knows it but doesn't understand it, so that, you know, it doesn't mean much. And then uh, perhaps you have pure consciousness at night sometime and you wake up in the morning and you say, what was that? I had all this stuff. But it's dark, it's small, it's here, intermittent, and, and over time, let's say it becomes permanent. Mm -hmm. By the time it becomes permanent, you know, it's substantial. You're walking down the street, you know, that, what is this pure, what is this thing? It's, and then uh, it gets clearer and clearer and clearer and clearer. I don't believe that clarity ever stops because there's almost an infinite distance to go to the infinite. Now, now at some point you realize that you are that unbounded field of consciousness and at another point you realize not only are you that unbounded field of consciousness you're also its fluctuations you're at its second phase its movement phase and at some point you realize not only are you on the subtle level of understanding and experience uh, that movement of consciousness the even the relative your daily life is part of the story of that consciousness it's, and at that point you start thinking, well, there's some kind of wholeness here, some kind of knowingness that includes everything. So, yes, pure consciousness is fundamental, but in my opinion, in my experience, so is the subtle relative, so is the gross relative. The illusion, it, it, the gross relative is kind of an illusion if you don't have pure consciousness and if you don't see the connecting links between the subtlest to the grossest, the connecting links is the experiencer. There's so much talk about, well, there's no experiences, there's no I, there's nobody having the experience. Well, go ahead and, you know, die if you like, because that's <laughs> what you're describing. But you're not describing that. Uh, you're describing an experience. Somebody's having it. Now, the somebody that's having that experience of the absolute is, is, is very, very, very subtle. Very subtle. It's so subtle that it's not recognized as an I. That's how I look at it. And then ultimately it will be. Yeah, okay. I mean, there are a lot of people out there who say there is no I, you know, there is no person, and, and so on and so forth. And, uh, and they go around teaching that way. Uh, yeah, and that's So you're saying that there is one, but it's so subtle that you can miss it, uh, even if you're in some kind of awakened state. I mean, people who are not in an awakened state, you know, they practice self inquiry who am I, who am I, who am I? And, you know, they never find anything anything substantial that they can say this is the kernel of my existence the I and, and you know hopefully eventually they arrive at unboundedness and they realize, oh I am that unboundedness but you're also saying that there is some kernel there is some uh, individual knower who stands at the door between the absolute and the relative and that's subtle and and takes some time to actually recognize if one ever does every guru every teacher every uh, movement <laughs> throughout time from the ancient rishis to the present teachers and luminaries they all open their mouth and say stuff based on their experience based on their experience if if the case was that nothing matters no path it's all unbounded don't have to open your mouth at all yeah but it's not like that right it's just not like that yeah on the on the day-to-day -day level we all need a little help yeah I mean, there are even teachers who say, you know, you don't need teachers, you don't need, you don't need techniques, you don't need anything that, but keep coming to my meetings. They actually make a joke out of that. <laughs> Okie dokie. Um, does one need to meditate to progress since pure awareness is already everywhere? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> We've kind of covered it, but kind of. you know, it, you know, you want to become a good violinist. What do you do? You practice, right? Right. It's really that simple. Um, there well, are the flip side of this question yeah. would be, yeah. if you're realized, if you're awakened, if okay. you're enlightened, yes. Yes. you know, why would you need to meditate? And not, and you said in the last thing, well, I have a body, and the body needs rest. But if you're really established in pure consciousness, doesn't that sort of silence of pure consciousness constantly sustain and refresh and rejuvenate the body without having to sit down and, and engage in a specific practice? Well, 
is my hair white? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Is is every guru or teacher? I'm not a guru or that, right. but it, they're they're aging. They all age and die. Yeah. So yes, it's a good idea to to close your eyes once in a while and have a, an authentic technique mm -hmm. from you know from a good tradition and practice that because it rests the body. But apart from that, everybody meditates according to the level of their consciousness. So if you're awake, your, your meditation is different mm -hmm. than somebody who isn't awake. Um, there's no denying, if I close my eyes, I have different experience when my eyes are open. Right. I'm not saying it's greater or better, I'm just saying it's different. And that's enjoyable. That's enjoyable. Here's some points from our friend that we'll talk about more later on. All right. But um, in a profound awakening, this this friend of mine who I mentioned in the last interview who sent in a lot of rather skeptical questions uh, and we'll come back to these other questions but um, in a profound awakening there is not one shred of difference in experience with eyes closed and eyes open no division between inner and outer if all one's mind stream has if one's mind stream has been stilled which is why meditation is no longer des no longer desirable or even feasible um, it is clearly seen in experience that there is all there is is the self, silence, and one is that. Where would one go for more of anything? Um, every moment is meditation, empty of self-will, doing God's bidding. Awakened people who meditate are not talking about a compulsive formal meditation. They are just sitting in silence, enjoying the view. A mantra is a vehicle, and once the river has been crossed, the vehicle gets discarded. To want to go somewhere twice a day that is other or better than where we are is illusion. If there's an expectation of more or better or different, then we're still processing. Only the mind craves more, better, and different, and thus the seeking continues. The real reason why continuing to meditate while claiming liberation is that we feel incomplete. If further evolution is to take place, it will unfold by itself. It's not something we could make happen by formal meditation after a certain point. Uh, I think that does it. Okay. What do you say to all that? That's what we've been talking about, is that um, that's kind of like saying that's the opposite of what I'm saying. Just yeah. like, just like essentially the difference between Advaiti thinking and my thinking and my experience is that I say everything has value, has full value, eyes open, eyes closed, that tree out there, this room, has value in terms of the self. When the experience is in the self, totally within the self, then all the experiences are enjoyable or not enjoyable in terms of the self. In terms of the self means that you're inside the ocean of conscience, everything has come inside. It hasn't been thrown into the garbage heap of life, it's been absorbed into the wholeness of pure consciousness and it exists there as an experience. In, or, in order to become immortal or have the experience of infinity, everything has to be included. There has to be an experiencer, there has to be an I, there has to be a knower. And if there's a knower, if there's an experience, if there's any experience whatsoever, and it doesn't matter how non-dual you've become, you can see the wall and the tree and the car. I'm saying that all that experience becomes the self, known as the self. But since it doesn't disappear, it takes on its full value. It's there anyway. If you say, I am all this, but I am not all that, it's certainly a legitimate experience of, of this state that I talked about, this CC state. It's separate. It has no meaning. Everything, you kind of jumped into the absolute without incorporating everything else. Now, when I close my eyes, there's pure consciousness. When I open my eyes, there's pure consciousness. When I sleep, there's pure consciousness. It's always there. It's been there forever, in my sense. I haven't. Okay, it's always been there. Always, and never will. Nothing disturbs it. If I'm in pain, it's there. If I'm not happy, it's there. If I'm happy, it's there. It's always there. 
Jesus. So I agree with that. There's nowhere to go. However, I continue to experience everything else as well. And everything else that I experience um, kind of adds to, is within, is part of the experiencer of the silence who's inside the silence. Inside the silence reveals what the silence is. The silence is non-movement, movement, the subtle relative and the gross relative, all as one continuum of consciousness, one enjoyed, understood, experienced um, phenomenon of consciousness. And to say that, you know, I, if I, you know, there was, <laughs> there's some, somebody complained about because I move around a lot, that guy can't possibly have any experience. I mean, he's twitchy. He's, uh, he's jumpy. He's jumpy. I mean, he, a person like that couldn't possibly, well, we're all different. You know, a horse doesn't look like me and, and Rick doesn't look like, we're all different and we have different personalities. And whether we're awake or not awake, we, we all act differently. Um, well, I mean, Nisargadatta was kind of jumpy himself. He was very animated and, you know, shouting and gesticulating and smoking <laughs> cigarettes constantly. And he's regarded as one of the most enlightened people. All right. You know, our, well, good. I'm glad <laughs> you're saying that. Um, I did have one or two people say that, you know, yeah. kind of awful, you know. <laughs> but no, and, and there's, no, there's no real answer to what she's asking because what she's saying is completely true on its own level. Mm. Pure consciousness, it does exist, it doesn't move, it's always going to be there. Now, over the years, I realized that kind of along with that pure consciousness, everything else is included. And you could say, you could say that it's pure consciousness as well, but it doesn't lose its value. It doesn't go away. I filled my basket with it. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I thought of an example that might help to illustrate it, you know, using our ocean analogy from the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if one might say, okay, if this person has realized that he is the ocean, then continuing to meditate is like taking cups of water and dumping them into the ocean. What does he expect to add by taking cups of water and dumping them into the ocean? But the way we use the analogy, you know, continuing to meditate would be more like, oh yeah, I got it, I'm the ocean. Now, you know, let's explore within myself and see what can be discovered here. You know, this fish and this, this uh, you know, underwater, you know, formation, this coral reef, there's, there's, a, there's an endless world for exploration and it doesn't mean that you're sort of becoming more oceany, you know, as a result of that explanation. You're just becoming more uh, intimately familiar with the finer details of, of your own self, of what you already know yourself to be. Okay, I like that analogy and, and looking at it a little more fundamentally is that let's say, let's say you're this ocean of consciousness. And you, and you see all kinds of, you see this, or you see that, or you see that. The ocean doesn't move, but you see all this stuff that's in it. The more of these points that you see, the more of them that are connected, they're kind of like, they're kind of like the microscope and telescope that looks at the, at the, uh, that is the self that looks at the wholeness, the self that looks at the ocean. And because there's more of those points and there's more connected unity to the whole thing, you, you know, and this is just words now, it, it feels like the mirror of consciousness can see pure consciousness even bigger, even bigger. The more of that structure of consciousness you see, you're, you're kind of cleaning the mirror and you see more and more of this purity, there's more and more of the silence, more and more. And seeing more and more of the silence doesn't denigrate or, or put away the points of silence or the movement of silence. Quite on the contrary, they complement each other. They, you know, there, there's controversy in, um, in, in Vedic circles as to, um, how do you explain the absolute? How does the absolute manage manage to not eliminate everything? Because it's absolute; it's already everywhere. And the only way, in my my experience, is that there's something just as absolute as that, equal to that. Which is 
pure consciousness. It's the knower. The knower is unbounded. His fluctuations are everywhere the same. Are you Every drawing a distinction here between the absolute and pure consciousness? Like they're two different things? No, two absolutes. <laughs> Three absolutes, sorry. There's, there's no other way to put it into words. Let's put it this way. If, the, if there was nothing but the absolute, nothing but silence, you wouldn't exist. Right. That's not how I experience it. There's the silence, and then there's this knower of the silence who is just as unbounded as the silence. Just as unbounded. And because he's just as unbounded, just because I'm just as unbounded, I can look at the silence and say, yeah, that's silence. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's immovable. It's always been there, always will be. But so will I. Mm. How else can you say it? And that knower of the silence, uh, which is un just as unbounded as the silence, uh, that that is all one knower that you and I and everyone else are or are you saying that somehow there's the Harry Alto knower and the Rick Archer knower and so on that are each just as unbounded as the silence yes the second thing yes so there's seven billion unbounded there's trillions unbounded knowers yes yes well you have to know it to know it but yes huh. yes so I guess what you're saying is that every life form uh, at, at the subtlest level or at the junction point of you know the absolute and the relative or something uh, contains an absolute body or an absolute um, form which is you know unbounded and, and just as silent just as unbounded as the absolute as the silence and that that is the instrument uh, through which the silence is known and lived yes I think what I'd like to do now for the next bit is um, read some passages from posts that you posted on your blog okay. and uh, just you know use those as springboards okay. for discussion. Okay. And then maybe we'll come back to some of these other questions sure. again. Absolutely. So one of your blog posts is entitled All Inclusive Awareness. And uh, I just, I took snippets out of these that just sort of jumped out at me a little bit. It's, uh, I am no more active with eyes closed or eyes open. Also, I am no more still with eyes closed or eyes open. Do you like that? <laughs> I don't know. For some reason that jumped out at me. And that's the case. You know, this, this pure consciousness, this overriding, overarching experience of pure consciousness is this immovable silence, right? Mm -hmm. And that immovable silence, you know, this is, these are just words again, have become kind of like the eye of the self, the ears of the self, and, they, and whatever is seen, heard, tasted, and touched feels like it's part of that silence, like that. So when I open my eyes, it feels like I'm not going anywhere. I'm already there. I don't leave from anywhere because I've already left. Mm -hmm. um, yes, that's that's the sense of an awakened person's consciousness that everything's been accomplished, except all experiences are additions. They take that. Um, how do you put it? There's an aspect of pure consciousness that's active, that's constantly growing constantly uh, becoming clearer and because of that clarity like I said earlier because of that clarity and the movement of consciousness the silence of consciousness also becomes appears to become greater like that bird analogy clear blue sky right yeah. clear blue sky nothing there zero you don't see anything but you know it's there a bird flies across the sky or some something across the sky a plane and suddenly the sky looks immense now and the, in, in terms of pure consciousness the more of those points that you see those illuminations those fluctuations um, the bigger broader silence appears to be yeah like that even I get that I mean yeah. when I do something really dynamic like uh, traveling you know and I'm going through an airport or something like that yeah the yeah. airports are particularly like because they're so chaotic, oh yeah you know, there's so much like going on too. yeah and, and it kind of but it it seems like it stirs up the silence even more. Yes. That you, yes. you, you feel even more contrastingly this deep, profound silence in the yes. midst of all that chaos. That's pretty well what I mean. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I would imagine you also even see the, the chaos and the people and the, all the hustling and bustling as silence also. 
Well, imagine for a moment if you actually saw your consciousness. You, you imagine that you, that you can see silence, mm -hmm. see it. What does it look like? It looks like a field of self-awareness. The seeing of it is inside of the experience. And when the seeing of silence is inside the experience, then it's like a cosmic eye. It does not eliminate what, what, it, what you would say or somebody else might say is out there. Mm. It says, I am that also because you're within the silence. The silence is everywhere. That sight doesn't come out of the silence when it's looking at the tree or the bird or the other person. It stays inside, as it were. Yeah. Okay. So um, this here's a an excerpt from this is a little bit longer one from the an excerpt from the blog post entitled "The Wonderful Diversity of Unbounded Awareness." Um, I hear personified intelligence. I see personified intelligence. And interrupt me if you want to comment as I go, if, if I haven't finished. Okay. Uh, I am aware of and participate in a divine social structure of divine beings of nature. We cohabit all the layers of creation in complete harmony and natural awareness. The fullness and complete divinity of this space is my oneness with God. With the divine social hierarchy that is kept lively by the dynamics of the eternal relationship of God and His creations. I realize that the absolute does not break up and the relative does not em emerge. I am both realities together in their fullness. And I actually think this other part is from later on in the thing, so maybe okay. you want to comment on that first part. You would pick that one. <laughs> <laughs> I like that stuff. <laughs> um, what I'm talking about is the, the subtle, uh, subtle. let's call it the subtle relative. Mm -hmm. The subtlest as aspect of um, relativity where consciousness is very lively and these kind of experiences can be had and, and are being had by any, any consciousness that's dwelled in pure consciousness for some time and become habituated to pure consciousness begins to see the subtle relative as well. The subtle relative is extremely close to pure consciousness, mm -hmm. extremely close. It's, it's part of the fabric of pure consciousness. And in terms of God, you know, starting from the grossest level, people are devoted to God, right? They're devoted, yes, uh, give me this, I, I, I want my children to be happy, I want whatever I want. And then as consciousness grows, you begin to sense on a more, on a feeling level of God's presence, right? Maybe in your heart. You say, oh, well, what is this? It feels like God is in my heart or in my consciousness somehow. And then as that gets clearer and clearer, Perhaps the senses get involved in that experience as well. You know, great Christian mystics have described how they see the heavens and their and the hosts of heavens and all these hierarchies, and and so have the Hindus and so have the Muslims. All of the and the Buddhists have all talked about these levels. I'm not talking about them as something that you go after. I'm talking about them as part of the experience of pure consciousness becoming clearer and clearer and seeing the fine fabrics of its own nature, your own nature. Mm. That's how I'm talking about it. Here's something related to that. Okay. Uh, I ex from the same essay, I experience innumerable beings of light flowing into a centered heaven that is my heart, a universal space of cosmic and individual dimensions, a huge, a huge cosmic cone of energy structured from millions of devas, all streaming into my heart, the heart of God. I experience this one great creator, the one great God, shining self-effulgent in the center of creation. What a wonderful secret. Maybe we should have kept it a secret. <laughs> um, yes, that's my experience. Or and um, all the time, or when you tune into it. One of the things that happens, um, which is which is kind of interesting, a little bit of an offshoot on this. Years ago, I'd have to go somewhere. You know, if somebody'd ask me a question, I say, "Oh, let me think. Let me think." Uh, yes, okay, and then. Um, at least I could go there and I could find an answer. Now, in the last so many years, I don't go anywhere. You know, whatever I experience, 
comes out of my mouth. If it doesn't come out, I don't have it. Now, that particular experience is what to say about it. It's, it's there. And the, it's simple. Every experience is simple. It sounds glorious and it is glorious, but it's also so simple it's not funny. And I have to say at this point is that all these experiences that, that I describe are, they're infinitely simple. And the reason they're infinitely simple is because they're in terms of the self, which is the simplest state of awareness, right? And if they're in terms of the self, that means they're close to the self, or they're reflected in the self, or they are the self, therefore they are very simple. Everybody can have them. Anybody yeah. can have them. That's what I'm trying to say. Anybody can have flashy experiences, but they come from that established state of silence. Yeah, I think the reason you're saying that is that there's a, a concern you know that people might get um, sidetracked by by flash, and and just fascinated with that, uh, while neglecting the simple foundation of it all, and um, and I understand that, and people do do that, and the, but the, and the reason I bring up such experiences is that you know it's a little bit different. I I feel that sometimes um, you know enlightenment or realization is dumbed down in in terms of being only that silence and that's all yes. there is to it okay and anything else that you're kind of beginning to elaborate on in terms of subtle beings or you know devas and all this stuff you're just getting caught up in fluff you know you're getting caught up in mind candy that that is not really essential and important and you're just going to distract people so I'm just trying to create a balance okay in that respect uh, okay. and I think you, you know, a person can go to either Either extreme, extreme. Yes, yes. And, uh, and but a really kind of mature picture would be, yeah, the silence has has to be there as the foundation. And once we become really familiar with that silence, you you may begin to experience all this stuff. So deal with it. <laughs> Enjoy it. Yeah. Yes. No, that's perfect. I yeah. like that. Okay. Uh, so uh, perhaps a lot of these are are so S somewhat along the similar, same yeah. lines. Let's see if you have one that see. isn't of the yeah, celestial yeah, level. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, okay, um, spiraling fields of light, personified intelligence. Uh, here's here's a good one. Um, heartfelt clarity. This is from that essay. Um, recently, Catherine, my wife, experienced a tangible fullness and opening of her heart that has not diminished over time. Her experiences had the extraordinary effect of now revealing both of our heartfelt, heart-centered physiologies in my awareness as the structure, emergence, and expressions of unbounded unity. Yeah. That's well, one of the one of the qualities of one of the benefits of pure consciousness is this. There's this uh, quality of. Um, you know, I'm of a Finnish heritage, so we don't like using the word love. <laughs> but yes, that's the feeling. Mm -hmm. That's the feeling is that there's this, um, within this knowingness, within this knowledge, within this um, uh, pure consciousness is, is the growth of uh, love for not, for um, obviously first for your immediate family, but even for your society, even for the world. and. That kind of only happened to me in the last 10 years or so, you know. Mainly I was, you know, most of my life I'd be, I wanted more and more knowledge, more and more knowledge. But then as that knowledge got bigger and bigger, then uh, in terms of my own family, I noticed that there was just a much deeper feeling. And say when Kathy has a profound experience, the shared phenomenon of that experience um, created a much, you know, exponentially greater sense of, of feeling of expanded love. That's all that is. And, and, and that has grown in me, you know, the, the fact that I'm out here talking to people um, means that I'm, I'm wanting to share and I've re really never wanted to do that in the past. I loved it on the so-called mountaintop by myself. <laughs> yeah. But I, I, re I can't say much more about that. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, if I read more experiences from your blog, it's going to be more of these celestial beings Let's type, okay. of, type no of things. No problem. 
because um, I'm forewarned. Yeah, because <laughs> I picked a lot of those things out. Yes. Um, so uh, here, here's one I haven't read. Uh, you can comment on. Then maybe we'll go back to some of these other questions. Okay. The structural intelligence, the very physicality of vibrating knowledge and love, I perceive as a highway between God and me. This solid connection, structured from universal, con universal existence and all of its layers, is known and experienced as one continuum of my individual to cosmic awareness. It feels and is so concretely solid that it seems I could actually physically traverse or walk this road to God. It is thick with interweaving layers of knowledge, love, and light that literally put me into the presence of God. God's awareness is reflected in my awareness. I experience within my heart, my mind, and my senses, my whole body, a phenomenal co-created divine, terrestrial, and cosmic hierarchy that is precisely and perceptually related to all levels of my life. All aspects and functions of my body I experience as structurally and physically extending to this personified totality. This relationship unites all emerging events into one continual experience of individual unity. I couldn't say it better myself. <laughs> <laughs> that kind of covers what we've been talking about in many ways, doesn't it? I think and, so. And I think the emphasis for me is that pure consciousness is not just pure consciousness. It involves the body, the senses, the mind, the environment, the universe. All of it is included in pure consciousness. The word pure means everything included to me. Uh, let's call it unbounded consciousness. Unbounded to me doesn't mean exclusive to unboundedness only. It means inclusive of everything. Unbounded to me means wholeness. It's all there. And the body, our physiologies, um, are part of that experience. And I guess many people kind of put the body down and the environment down and the gross relative. Um, I would say that the so-called physical, uh, our physical existence, the story of our lives, our daily activities, our physiologies, when, they, when those aspects of consciousness or those aspects of our lives are seen in terms of the self, that's when uh, uh, awareness is at its full range. Pure consciousness is one fundamental first step. S perhaps a subtle relative, you start seeing some of that. Second step, you still have pure consciousness. Third step would be seeing everything in terms of the self, including the relative. And even a sense of the universal existence is there. Ultimately, you sense, I sense that the universe affects me, the stars, the galaxies, the moon, the sun. I, I can feel their influence, even if I can't totally see them or anything. I feel their cosmic influence, as it were. So all of that is inclusive in this huge uh, sense of wholeness that eventually evolves. And you eventually get to. Everybody gets to. Okay. Yeah. All right. So let's yeah. come back to some of these. Yes. <laughs> um, did I already ask this one? What do you mean that the senses can experience the absolute? I don't think I did ask that. No, but we kind of covered that. But, you know, that was kind of a surprise to me. You know, this is kind of interesting because I think anybody who has the experience of pure consciousness actually sees something. Only they don't think of it as seeing. They think of it as something. What is the, how do I know pure consciousness is there? There's some kind of sense that it's there. Not, but I, thinking back on the witness when I first started having it, I wouldn't have said that I could see it, but I could, I, now I'd say, of course I saw it. I saw it. It was there. It was a seeing as well as a knowing. And, and that's what I mean. That kind of seeing, that kind of hearing, that reverberation of pure consciousness actually has a sound. The sound is the intelligence becoming manifest into the, uh, into the, you know, objective world. Mm -hmm. So the senses get involved over time. It starts on a subtle level of feeling, subtle level of understanding, and ultimately the senses get involved in the experience of even pure consciousness. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. There's a question about you know, describing your experience right now, this minute, and how it's different than at other times, but that kind of reminds me of a question uh, which I want to ask, which is that um, 
you know, like a couple weeks ago, you came over to my house, and it took quite a while to give you directions to get to my house. It was sort of like, uh, kind of like trying to guide a blind man through a maze or something, you know. And so, I mean, and you've told me before, like, you know, you can easily get lost driving around town or something. So, what is your actual experience that makes it sort of difficult to deal with? And you, like in that panel discussion we had a, a couple, a month or two ago, you said, you know, when you got married, you needed to get married because you couldn't even manage by, you couldn't write a check or anything. Kathy had to take care of it. So, is there a sort of a sense that you uh, kind of are so out there and, and you know, reveling in cosmic realities that it's it's really hard to deal with mundane realities sometimes? Like, no, like I was always like I was always like that. Yeah, but you've always been reveling in cosmic yeah, realities. No, but I was always and I'm not implying So it's more of a personality thing. It's very much an idiosyncrasy of my life. Yeah. You know, I was that way as a kid. I, I don't have a sense of direction. Uh -huh. I didn't have it okay. ever. Okay. And so it wasn't something that developed as I Consciousness guru was always there. So, th in your opinion, then uh, somebody could be in uh, every bit as evolved a state of consciousness as you are, whatever state you're in, and or yet, a lot more, or yeah. a lot more, and yeah. yet be an airline pilot or a, a brain surgeon, totally, or totally, something. but not me. Yeah, right. <laughs> Don't have me fly your plane. I'll go to Timbuktu or something. <laughs> you're right in the ground. <laughs> yes. No. No. Absolutely. As a matter of fact, if that's their tendency, they'll get sharper and clearer and more direction oriented. Yeah. I went the way that I naturally am. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You so, know what uh, I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So, so just to, to to you know beat home the point. So enlightenment uh, is not in any way a uh, impediment to functioning in the relative in a practical world. It, in, you, you would even say it's a, it's an aid to it, if, you know, if it's whatever, properly integrated. Whatever talents you have, if, it, if it's kind of, a, you know, they'll grow yeah. those talents and, and, and maybe, uh, and incidentally, I'm not saying I'm particularly enlightened. I'm just telling you what my experience right. is. But, yeah, yeah. Whatever it yeah. is, um, draw your own conclusion. However enlightened one may get, yes. you're saying it, it doesn't mean you're, you're just going to be sort of non-functional. And we've seen that, you know, all these stories about yogis who just sort of, you know, have to have people feed them and everything, or, or they'll just go wandering off into the forest, and they don't seem to be sort of really grounded in the practical world. That, that's true, but if, you know, I'm an artist, so yeah. that's highly focused. You see how detailed my art is. Very, very tiny little things I'm painting all yeah. the time. Extreme focus, so I'm very directionally oriented when I'm painting. Mm -hmm. So maybe, you know, it's not like I'm not focusing. It's yeah. just somehow my sense of direction when I'm driving a car or something <laughs> tends to be uh, I've never had an accident uh, knock on wood or whatever <laughs> so not it's not that I can't drive it's sometimes you know you know I, I'm visual you know I look if, if they remove the tree from a corner that I'm used to seeing a tree and it, it takes me years to recover from that <laughs> 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 oh, okay uh, all right okay good um, What is the function of memory? You know, memories are really interesting, isn't it? Have you ever thought of your memory? You know, you're a kid, you're a teenager, you, now you're a guy, whatever age you are, and everything that you've gone through is just a memory in the past. And in a sense, the future is a memory too, in, a, in, in the sense that you don't know what it is, but you, you envision it could be like this, and it's all sort of, uh, it's sort of something you remember. now. My experience with uh, states of consciousness or states of um, experience that I've had is that when I have them, it's like I remembered to have them. I remembered to have pure consciousness. Mm -hmm. I remembered to have this unified state of consciousness. I remembered that sight is part of that. It's, there's this quality to my experience, and I think everybody ex experiences that memory, you're remembering who you are, you're remembering mm -hmm. where you've been, you're remembering uh, wholeness. It's like it's there, so somehow you lost it, now you've gained it, and because you gained it, it must have been a memory. Yeah. There's that sense there, right? You know, in the end of the Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna says to Lord Krishna, my memory has been restored, you yes. know? I know who I am now, or whatever words he used. It feels uh, that way to me, yeah. that, that memory is being restored. Mm -hmm. Because 
the natural experience is that human consciousness is, is unbounded, is infinite. Where did it go? You forgot it. Hmm. You forgot to remember that you're awake. Hmm. It's that simple. Isn't that, isn't that something, really? Yeah. And yet, it's not, you know, this could also be misconstrued. I mean, you, it's not like you should walk around all day saying, whoop, got to try to remember the self, remember the self, remember That's the right. self. No. As some kind of a, like, no, you know, it, to drive yourself crazy doing that. It's not that kind of memory. No, it's, it's, it's something that happens naturally. And, yeah. and isn't something that can be contrived or thought up. Right. It's not that kind of memory. Yeah. And theoretically, an older person who is starting to lose their memory and you know can't find their car keys, that kind of thing, they could very well be perfectly established in pure consciousness. It's not affected by that kind of memory loss that comes with older age. And I so don't on. think so. Yeah. And you know, this whole thing about appearance—what should a, an awakened person look like? You know, um, you don't have to be intelligent. You don't have to be talented. You don't have to be anything specific t to be awake. You know, wakefulness is so natural that it's, it's available to anybody. Yeah. Right? Yep. Okay. <laughs> um, I think we, tell me if you think you want to add anything to this. How does the intellect or understanding help the growth of consciousness that we haven't already covered? Well, I, th I, th I am a, I do like the fact that that every experience has an understanding component to it. Within the experience itself, one of the joys of the experience is that you understand it and and you get it. And when you get it, there's a sense of stability and permanence and continuity and connectedness between people and the environment when the understanding says, aha. Uh -huh, this is all part of that wholeness. So that's what I mean by intellect. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of teachers out there these days teaching, saying all kinds of things. And this question is pertains to that. Um, how would a person know that they are listening to the truth? The sad thing about knowledge is that, let's say you're in a high state of consciousness and I'm in a lower state of consciousness, then I will hear what you say on my level. And you will speak from your level. Now, maybe they can <laughs> go together a little bit because you said something profound if I trust you. But generally speaking, the, the movement of consciousness moves from higher to lower. When, um, in a but you situation. Can, but, yeah. Yes, that's the way it is. And, what can you do about that other than keep speaking what you know and and ultimately or eventually somebody will hear it or not hear it up to their up to their lights hmm. yeah and I would say something about this question that there should be some kind of resonance with one's experience you know I mean if somebody's saying something there's uh, that's supposed to be truth. Uh, if it is, there should be some kind of resonation or some kind of um, connection on the level of your experience that that kind of verifies it for you or makes it seem right to you or something. You know what I mean? Everybody has some intuition, right? Yeah. And, and some deep in ground, even if they don't know how to talk about it. Um, pure consciousness is universal. Therefore, somewhere you have it, and you have intuition. Everybody has some intuition, and yes, you intuit that. Yeah, this person's saying the truth. This, hmm. I want to hear more of what he's saying. I agree with that. Yes. Yeah, and there's actually a flip side to that, which is that people get that intuitive aha when they listen to or read something profound, yes. and then they think that that's basically all there is to it, is that intuitive aha, and they don't realize how much vast uh, potential for maturation of actual experience there is. We all tend to, when we, when we have, let's say we have a profound experience, everybody tends to say, this is all there is, mm -hmm. right? Oh, I, I've made it now. <laughs> yeah. Um, what is the process that lo allows love to grow? You know, you know, when we were first talking about consciousness and the movement of consciousness, mm -hmm. the movement of consciousness is the movement of love. It's the movement of uh, connectedness. Connectedness means unity. Unity means um, 
deep feeling. So if consciousness grows, then the sense of unity grows, the sense of this movement of consciousness, this continuity, this love is a byproduct of consciousness becoming aware of itself and you becoming the knower of that uh, experience, the knower of that experience is the, is the being, is the individual that feels love. It's not the absolute that feels love. You, as an I, are the loving entity that uh, can communicate and talk and, and, and help and whatever. Mm. Yeah, I, re I read a nice interview, a nice lecture by Maharshi the other night that I had heard him, I had heard a recording of a thousand times. But it, basically he was saying that, you know, love grows by culturing the habit of not minding the crude and minding more and more the subtle, you know. And, and just the, the sort of the subtler values get more habituated and then her appreciation grows by virtue of that. And with more refined appreciation, love grows. Yeah. That's essentially what I'm saying, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what is the dying process and can, <laughs> can we skip it? <laughs> okay, the dying process. Um, You're the one who gave me these questions. Yeah, I know. Uh, <laughs> that one I should have skipped. <laughs> we should have skipped that one. Not. The, um, the dying process is the, is the process of being born, waking up. That's what the dying process is. Oh, okay, is. in that sense, yeah. Yes. Sure. That's what it is. Yeah. Imagine if nothing was passing, if nothing was ending. Mm -hmm then everything would die eventually. It would be, there would be no rebirth. Now, to me, there is no such thing as, um, okay, if you want to talk about illusion, I think death is the biggest illusion. And, and, and it's an illusion because human, human beings can be immortal. They can, they can gain immortality. In their physical bodies? Or on the level of consciousness? There are many levels to the body. Mm. Okay, and ah, good point. right. So, um, well, you were talking earlier about some kind of unbounded level of the individuality that interfaces with the pure silence. So, presumably, it's not only unbounded, but it's eternal. I'm not a big advocate of that the absolute is the experiencer of unbounded infinity. I'm a component. I'm a proponent, proponent of that the individual. On, on the subtle level, um, can be and will be and is eternal. Hmm. Okay? On a, an individual has. Now, an individual in the sense that it's an awake individual. Right. That means immortality to me. That experiencer will never die. Mm hmm. And even if it's not an awake individual, I mean, how about my dog? I mean, is there some essence to the dog that's eternal and that essence is going to kind of grow in its capacity to appreciate its, its own eternal nature over time? I believe that's true, you know, get, going on to a bigger and bigger level and, you know, how do you answer questions? You know, they say the universe will end eventually, but uh, to me it's like the universe goes to sleep just like we do and night we wake up. We don't know what's the next universe or the next one, if there is one. Yeah. Um, where's, it, where's the universe going to go? And actually my next question uh, ties in with this next question, which is how do I know you're not making all this up, which is that when you say a thing like that, the individual is eternal and we all go to sleep when the universe dissolves, I mean, is that just something you read in some book or is, it so, is there some aspect of your personal experience that kind of substantiates that for you? Okay. When you have the experience of pure consciousness, your consciousness it's unbounded and then you and you see the fluctuations of that pure and those fluctuations are also eternal those fluctuations are the universe I can see the universe in those I can intuit it and to a certain degree see it now that's that's just my little old consciousness um, how is it that I can see that I know that, that the universe is my consciousness I can see it. It's an expression of your consciousness. It's an it's expression of my. It's contained within your consciousness. It's, contain, it's not the other way around. Right. 
it's the universe mm -hmm. is contained within my and yours too and right. everybody's yeah. human consciousness is the uh, movement of consciousness is the wholeness of consciousness and is the material universe as well the material universe is also part of that consciousness. now once you know that you see that you intuit that um, there's no end to the universe either there can't be it, it's eternal if the absolute exists then everything is absolute If I, if I exist, then I'm absolute. You can't discount my body or anything and say, well, that's not real. How is it not real if the absolute is everywhere? Well, let's take this piece of paper. Um, you know, it's paper, but it's also the absolute in, in its essence, appearing as paper. And I could take a match to it, and it would be ashes and smoke and gases and okay. whatnot. But so it no longer exists as paper; it has been converted chemically into other things. Which and maybe the atoms themselves haven't been changed; they've just been totally rearranged and dispersed. So it, there's no no localized piece of paper anymore. It's been turned into other things. Every atom in your body was once part of a star, and you know. Uh, okay, this gets awful abstract. Okay, okay, <laughs> okay but I'll just say one thing here. Yeah. In terms of pure, unbounded consciousness, which is eternal, mm -hmm. even the coming and going of the universe is like that. Right. That's all I can say. So sure. it's coming. Yeah. Am I to like say that comes line. back again? I don't know. Right. In terms of eternity, even the universe is, is just a fleck of time. Yeah. Okay, I don't know if that answers the question, but it does. It's, if it's you pretty know. abstract. <laughs> it's very abstract. <laughs> right. Yes. Uh, okay. Um, why do so many people not have inner sight? And by inner sight, I guess we mean awakening. Yes. Um, why? Why is that? It's. To a person who's gone through these stages from kidhood on, um, it seems inconceivable that that um, it isn't recognized more because it just needs to be recognized. Um, even the first stage of uh, pure consciousness, why don't more people have it? My sense is that everybody has it, and they don't get it. They're overshadowed. They're, they're looking somewhere else. Yeah. It's not even, yeah, they're overshadowed, but I don't even find that word appropriate because I think it's there. <laughs> you know, I've described pure consciousness to many, 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 many people and, and, and they go, yeah, and it, like that it's gone. But they got it for a second mm -hmm. because it's always there. Yeah. How is that possible that they forget it the next second? But it seems to be. Um, well, if you're watching the movie, you know, it's like you're really into the movie, and some guy sitting next to you can say, now look carefully, see that little sparkly thing there? That's actually the screen. See, it has this big flat screen. And you say, oh, yeah, I see what you mean. But, wow, I'm really into this movie, and I'm going to keep watching it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I don't, I guess that's why we're here on Earth, to discover why we're not having the full experience. And some people have it, and they want to pass it on to other people. Yeah. Right? Or try to. Yeah. And maybe it's the nature of the age that it's rare. It's kind of tough, yeah. It's, a, it's an intense time we live in. Uh, maybe, you know, 100 years, 200 years from now, it'll become more common, and it would seem absurd to have conversations about it almost, because it's like everybody experiences it. Could be. Um, what do you think of free will? Or is everything determined? Well, that was a question that came up from people. More than one person asked me that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, if you think of any event, let's say there's an event, um, like we're meeting here, it's an event. It was kind of created by a previous event. By a, There's always a previous event to the event. Mm -hmm. And you could, let's trace this event back in time to when we first met. It started there. Yeah. But even before that, there before was that, event. we moved to Fairfield. And yeah, so there's you know. events, 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 events. Let's, yeah. we go to the first event. Mm -hmm. That first event is pure consciousness. 
Yeah. There's a fluctuation in pure consciousness that started this event. Now, that fluctuation is eternal. At that point, if you're aware of that first fluctuation of this stream of events, and there's no prior events, at that point, you could say you have free will. You're at the hub of the wheel. You could go in a million directions. Yeah. Um, at that point, you have this sense that free will is dominant. You can go in any direction, mm -hmm. and all these streams start there. But only at that point where there's no prior events. That would be an awakened mind. There's no prior event yeah. to that. That's a good answer. I think the hub of the wheel is a good metaphor. Yeah. You know, if you're at the hub, you can go down any spoke. Yes. If you're already out on a spoke, you're you're committed yes, to you, that you spoke. You can't go to that spoke. Right, suddenly. right. Yes. Yes. And uh, there's that verse in the Gita which goes something like, uh, "For many branched and endlessly diverse are the intellects of the irresolute, but the resolute intellect is one pointed." So the resolute intellect is like you're at the hub, you know, and from sitting there, you can move in any direction. You know, you're not sort of already that's bound right. and committed to something that's controlling you. On a more mundane level, you think of it, it all, it all feels like free will, right? Yeah. Hey, I want to move my arm. Yeah. Well, I decided to move that arm, right. so that you, feels like free will. You decided not to. So I'm enjoying the sense of free will. Mm -hmm. Perhaps it's, it's based on previous events, but my enjoyment is of the free will. So that's on a more mundane level, but yeah. it, that's how we enjoy our lives. We think it's all free will. Yeah. And in a sense, if we think it is, how is it different from free will? Yeah. Philosophers have debated this one forever. But, you know, from a practical, you know, from a practical standpoint, I think the point you brought out is really great, which, you know, a lot of people feel just sort of conditioned and bound and they're just rolling along and their life is out of control. But there really isn't in your experience now, isn't there a real sense of sitting at the hub, sitting at the junction the, the kind of the point at at, at which all streams of life uh, you know, emer from which they all emerge, isn't there a real sense of sort of being at the master switchboard Yes. and that there is this kind of freedom, uh, not only in terms of subjective unboundedness, but even freedom in terms of d decision making. Um, yes. Yeah. And it also feels like thoughts that you have on that level find their fulfillment. Yeah. And do they always? They, some take time, but they tend to happen. <laughs> tend to happen. More, yeah. More yeah, regularly, for sure. Do you ever, like, the other day, um, my wife was on hold with some company, and they were playing this stupid song over and over again, and she had it on speakerphone. And when she finally got off, the song was, like, going through my <laughs> head. <laughs> you couldn't get rid of I it. I finally turned on Pandora to listen to some <laughs> other music to get rid of. Do you, do you ever have that kind of silly, you know, condition kind of stuff? Not really. Mm. Probably in other ways, uh -huh. maybe not with music, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that's funny. Yeah. Um, what more can I do to speed up the process of gaining pure awareness? The, you know, we talked about meditating and um, obviously, um, you know, eating good food, having a healthy lifestyle, all of those affect what you experience, Yeah. right? now. Fortunately, once you're kind of you have a certain degree of wakefulness that influences you less and less, but on the path, as it were, then, for instance, a meditation uh, technique, it certainly helped me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when I started meditating as a young man, um, immediately stuff started happening yeah. in a way, in a way uh, that wasn't happening prior to that, you know, understanding, depth of experience, on, you know, all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Very rapidly developed. You could, I could see it and feel it and know it. So yes, meditation, good food. You weren't drinking a six pack and smoking a joint every night. That's right, that, I wasn't. That, that kind of thing helps. I mean, I, I say that facetiously, but I've been in touch with people who are kind of interested. You're obviously not in Denver. Yeah, <laughs> or Seattle. I've been in touch with people who were interested in spirituality, and 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 then you know, but they have a drinking problem, or they're they're doing something which seems to be hampering them, you know, while at the same time, like the elephant analogy. The elephant washes itself off in the river, then it gets out and throws mud on its back again, you know. So obviously, people have, we don't want to be lacking in compassion for people who have problems with that sort of thing, but. We also don't want to say that there's any um, 
uh, th th such things can be uh, accepted as legitimate paths to enlightenment? I, I don't know. I'm getting. Well, on. no, you get it. You know, my yeah. My whole angle is um, understanding, right? Right. I mean, you, you, if you read my blogs or anything else or how I speak, is um, I try to convey my experience and hope that somebody gets something out of that. And invariably of the some hundreds of people who commented on my uh, last talk, quite a few of them got something, whatever that something was. So yeah. that's, that's what I do. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, I think we've pretty much covered all these questions. They're all just sort of variations on, yeah. on the same theme. Um, so back to some other questions okay. here. Um, in, in terms of your own experience, did you ever have, uh, a, I, in, in the last interview we talked about this experience you had where you were wondering what all this unboundedness was that people were talking about, and then you had the experience of losing it for 10, 15 minutes, and you realized then, and that was horrible, and you realized then that you'd actually had it all your life. Did, and uh, Go ahead. You're gonna say. Did I ever tell you the experience I had with this, this, this word bliss? Did I think I, you told that in the last interview, too. Okay, you, I did that you know, one. People yeah. were saying, you were saying, what is all this bliss? <laughs> yes, yes, okay, I got <laughs> it. Well, but the point that we were making then is... Well, the point I was going to ask is, okay, did you, ahead. other than that 15, 10, 15 minutes, did did you ever have a dark night of the soul? You know, any kind of like really difficult time you went through where, uh, you know. The worst period that I uh, went through was in my late teens for about a year or two in my early 20s um, when I had the separation kind of stuff. You know, um, up, un up until that point I had this kind of unit of uh, sense that everything was, uh, was was consciousness was light and then it shrunk or separated into this kind of um, separation where I was aware that consciousness was there but I wasn't part of it mm. now for about two years you, you your individuality wasn't part you know, right. are you talking about a cosmic consciousness kind of thing where there was a separation between yes. absolute and, relative? and it was very clear um, at night it was 100% there during the day it was 100% there but I didn't like it mm. and it affected my uh, uh, my happiness level, my contentment level. I wasn't very, I wasn't very happy that everything was separate. That, yeah. I, that I wasn't happy, uh, and it was it was a kind of a tense time for me for about two years. Mm. And then um, I had some dramatic experiences of a of a subtle nature that changed that. That would be kind of. Well, you want to tell us what those were? Might as well these kind of more divine experiences so the subtle relative experiences where the um, where I started having um, along with that witness that silence came this more divine level of experience there was this more uh, celestial level of experience until it became so intense that uh, that I was almost lost in it but I wasn't because there was always that uh, that that call it a witness if you like or pure consciousness uh, was clear enough and big enough and full enough that it didn't disappear mm -hmm. along with this divine experience or these celestial experiences um, um, so they were there simultaneously mm. and so all that that um, disturbing separation disappeared they were close enough the, the, the subtle relative this the subtle levels of creation the heavens the the you know, the beings that exist on those levels were there along with um, this um, unboundedness. Now, there's an interesting point here. You know, there's a question in here somewhere that says uh, these divine levels of existence, whether you want to call them Christian or Vedic or whatever you want to call them, do they have a purpose? You know, most people don't think of them as having a purpose. Mm -hmm. But those, those subtle levels of creation are where the laws or the, all these aspects of nature function. How this is even in Christian, um, I shouldn't say even in, in Christian um, writings of, of the, um, the saints who wrote about those levels. They talked about, you know, these different levels, how this level creates um, 
this on the relative and this level creates this on the So those subtle levels of creation also have their personifications. Mm -hmm. Those are the hosts that live on those levels. Now, I'm not in any way advocating trying to look for these or go for them or use them as techniques. I'm just saying that these subtle levels of creation have a function. They're the, there's there's, there's um, how light, how, how air, how earth, how all the elements of nature uh, go through this process of becoming human beings is orchestrated on those divine levels. And in the future, if it's appropriate, I'll get more into that. <laughs> Why do you hesitate? Well, because it's 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 a field that nobody talks about and, and isn't isn't experienced by many people. It seems all the more reason to talk about it. Well, for in your case, yes. <laughs> but um, yes, you always want to leave something for the future, right? Yeah, P. T. Barnum. Yeah. There's 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 a tremendous amount, but I want to emphasize that. The, the reason you, anybody could see these or put them in their proper perspective is because there's a, there's a consciousness level that's silent enough, pure enough, that all of this celestial stuff and the gross relative stuff is incorporated into that experience. Mm. Okay. So you're saying that the, the um, realization or perception of these subtle things is what kind of got you out of this dark night if, if and it's in, and it's interesting because your experience follows a, a trajectory tra tra yeah, hard, hard. trajectory trajectory I know that's that, hard uh, to say <laughs> Ajashanti can't say that either he always screws up that <laughs> yeah, word okay. but it follows a path that um, is very much um, Lay, in, in line with what Mar Maharshi Mahesh Yogi laid out in terms of seven states of consciousness. He said, you know, this cosmic consciousness state, you're in, established in and as pure consciousness, and there's this separation. And then the gulf begins to be bridged, and there's this sort of unity of God consciousness, and then eventually uni total unity. And uh, I don't hear people talking so much about that un unity of God consciousness. Uh, they, they either seem to Maybe the, sometimes I wonder: Are people just in cosmic consciousness, and they think it's the final state, this you know, real self-realization and, and separation from the relative, or have they somehow jumped over, leapfrogged over the God consciousness stage, and they have arrived at unity, everything in terms of the self, without having ever uh, explored or have, having needed to explore all this kind of subtle relative that phenomena. There's two things that aren't talked about much. Mm -hmm. This state of celestial perception in relation to pure consciousness and then after unity experiences. Mm -hmm. After a unified uh, uh, wholeness of experience, there's an in, that's when the senses and the body and all these things move into the absolute and everything is seen from the absolute level. So those two areas aren't discussed much for some reason. Now, in order to I don't like to talk about the seven Maharishi seven states of consciousness because it, the implication is that I've gone through those states. Let's just say that I've had experiences that seem to correspond to those states throughout my life. Why but wouldn't you want to imply that you had gone through them? Just because I don't. Just because out I of can't. humility, sort of thing. I'm yeah. not really humble by nature. You've <laughs> seen that. I'm just saying. Okay. Okay. I seem to have those understanding and experience. I went. Waking, dreaming, sleeping, right? We all have that. CC was kind of this kind of witness, was there for years and years and years, didn't think anything of it. Cosmic consciousness. Yes, yeah. and, then, and then there were celestial experiences for many, many years. Um, and, then, and then that evolved into a kind of a unitative state that, you know, unity consciousness, whatever you want to call it, which is there now. You know, I have mm -hmm. this unitative state, but those are really simple states of consciousness because they don't really involve the senses or the body or the environment in a profound way. The, the way you describe them or the way you experience them? The way I experience them. I feel my experience started once I realized that everything, I am everything. Mm. So that's when it got interesting. That's when it got interesting <laughs> to me. And we haven't gone there yet. And, and you know, a year or two from now, uh, I'll, I'm actually, I can't believe it, but I'm actually, you know, like everybody else, I'm now writing a book. <laughs> Great. <laughs> so, and I'll, I will state all that in it. Okay, and then we'll talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. 
because I don't even know what to ask. I mean, I'm, I'm just poking around here asking what I can, but, um, you know, uh, I'm not familiar with your experience, obviously, as you are, so there's all kinds of things I, you could probably say that haven't even occurred to me to ask you to say. Um, you know, and I can only... Have I'm trying to stay practical as much as I can, you know, and yeah. it's, it's hard, but... Um, um, well, you know, I always found when I was teaching meditation that it was nice to give people a wide range. So I, even in an introductory lecture, I'd give some really practical down-to-earth benefits, and then I'd kind of take them on a vision of possibilities of ultimately, if you develop this area to its fullest extent, what could it be? And then I'd come back again to some the, another area, really down-to-earth benefits, then take it all the way to its extreme. And th that way, whoever's sitting in the audience, you're, you're kind of hitting their, their particular sweet spot, you know? There's millions and millions of people and teachers and gurus and movements and new age this and new age that who are dealing with those evolving issues, you know, up to, up to and including, you know, the first stages of enlightenment. Mm -hmm. And there are very few people dealing with these um, post-unity experiences yeah. or GC experiences. Because there isn't much of an audience for them or because yes. there isn't anyone qualified to talk about them? Both. Yeah. I guess if there were much of an audience for them, then members of that audience would become the teachers who would begin talking about them. So you're just saying it's really not as relevant to our collective evolution yet as it may be somewhere I'm just line. not that interested <laughs> because you know those those having said that I am interested in that because well you're totally interested in terms of that having been your own experience yes you're just saying you don't feel too much inclination to talk about it because there aren't that many people who are really ready to, to, li to hear it that's what it sounds like to me <clears throat> well but you're right. A lot more well, than I thought. I, I didn't expect yeah, to have... Yeah, you'd be surprised. I, I, mean, didn't, I didn't expect to have such a response from you know, yeah. all your... I really didn't. So is your book going to pull any punches, or are you really going to spill... I'm going to say everything. You're going to spill all the beans. Every, in, bean, yeah. that, every right. bean that I have. <laughs> Good luck with that. It takes people years to write books, but hopefully you have a fair amount of time to put into well, it. Well, I've, I've already probably written 20% of it. Great, great. Okay. Um, so, let me see here. You know, I, I would like to say that, you know, one of the things, uh, what there was this one person said, said something like, who do you think you are? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, I don't think I'm anybody special, mm -hmm. and I don't think I'm any different. I think everybody has the potential, everybody has the ability to have every experience. If I can have it, anybody can have it. That's my attitude, right. okay? And it's, and it's an honest, true attitude. I... I mean, look, I don't take up any more space. I take less space up than you do, so. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? I yeah. Mean, yeah. All righty. Um, there's more questions from this person who asked the question about why you would continue to meditate. It might, might bring out a few new little nuggets if I ask a few of these. Okay, uh, go ahead. We already talked about, you know, why continue to meditate. Uh, and uh, just say, I'll just throw out some of this stuff and see how you respond okay. to it. True awakening or self-realization is the end of all states. It's knowing the self or Brahman as who we are, who we really are. Out of this awakening, all the virtues unfold as old conditioning falls away. But there is no step-by-step -step process, no illusory self-noting change. And let me, f one more paragraph that relates. Although revelation continues on the subtler levels until all conditioned responses fall away and we are fully integrated and at rest in the heart of being, we don't need to make any effort to have grace unfold once the opening occurs. The self reveals itself to itself quite naturally. It's true. I don't have any problem no with No argument that. with any of that? <laughs> so, not really. Yeah, um, so what, whatever you're doing is not in violation with the, the, the question she's raising. In terms of practicing TM City program or, you know, doing this or doing that, it's all just... <clears throat> okay. What she's saying is correct. Mm -hmm. um, but the implication is that stop, you don't, stop doing stuff, stop enjoying stuff, sit in the silence like Buddha. Yeah, there's nothing more to explore, there's nothing not more to... That I don't uh, buy. Right. Um, because I've always seen more. The silence is there. The yeah. silence is 
huge, unbounded. Yeah. The movement of that silence, the revelations of that silence keep unfolding. I see more and more. Even the, even the gross relative, I, I go to national parks, enjoy myself. I don't sit like Buddha at the base of the trail. I climb to the top of the trail yeah. like everybody else. I have a good time. Mm -hmm. um, where I, I don't see advocating going into a retreat and staying there with the eyes closed for the rest of your life. Yeah, and I don't think that's quite what she's saying because uh, you know she has an active life and goes to the gym and has a couple of kids that she visits with and all that stuff. I think what she's saying is that you know if you're really at rest in the self, then there's no. Um, Seeking after, you know, more subtle experiences, which, and I, I, I mean, I agree with what you're saying here. I, I'm not sort of arguing her position. I'm just using that as a, as a stimulant to to bring out more stuff. What you're saying, and, you know, for instance, she said there are a thousand one experiences that Mother Shakti can show us, but truth is one. The yogic path does not necessarily lead to rest. The energy gets turned on and just keeps circulating. Only an act of grace can bring the energy or consciousness to rest. So, but what you're saying is you arrived at rest decades ago, and in that and that state of rest can be a platform, a uh, foundation upon which to enjoy further exploration. That there's no end to exploration. It's not like yeah. Go ahead. The waking up process doesn't eliminate uh, anything, and I just repeat myself. Mm -hmm. It does not eliminate the enjoyment of the relative, it increases the enjoyment of the relative. Right. It increases the enjoyment of the subtle relative, increases the enjoyment of the silence. Mm -hmm. All of it is increased, increased, increased. It's like you're owning more and more. You're not owning less and less. Um, if you have an experience of silence that overpowers you, mm -hmm. overpowers your intellect, overpowers, maybe that's a strong word, or overshadows everything else, then I could see that, yes, you would say, well, you know, let, just enjoy the silence. There's nothing you can do. Now, there isn't anything you can do to the silence. The silence is the silence. The, sil the pure consciousness is there. Now, the most wonderful thing about silence is that it's not silent. <laughs> I think that's the key point right there. It, it, you know, if silence is nothing but silence, and then, you know, once you're established in it, then all this stuff about devas and other experiences, it, it seems like a, a getting away from that pure silence. It's a stirring up of something which you finally had arrived at, and, you know, pure silence, oh boy, you're there, why stir it up again? But what you're saying is that silence isn't just silence, it isn't just flat absolute, that it's a field, it's a world of possibilities. And if you rest there long enough and start to see things clearly enough, you're going to begin to want to explore those possibilities. And I'm not even saying that, that, that um, you're not seeing them in terms of the silence, you are. You're yeah. seeing them in terms of the self. Let's call it the big self, yeah. rather than silence. So exploring these possibilities doesn't take you out of or away from, in any Ultimately sense, the it, big it, self. Yes. It's, not, it's not detracting or diminishing, or, and, and there's not a sense of, I'm not going to be content until I have explored all these things. It's more like established, it established in contentment, yeah. this is unfolding, and it's a joy to, to be a participant in that experience. I do agree that... Um, I don't mean to put words in your mouth, I'm just putting words everything in your <laughs> <laughs> Everything in pure consciousness does unfold from within itself, of course. Um, and there's this, uh, you know, you want to give it, you want to give some uh, validity to attention, mm -hmm. then I'll, I'll give some validity to attention. If I put my attention on um, an aspect of understanding, then understanding unfolds and it unfolds automatically, but it seems that the initial impulse has to be put there, mm. has to be started, take a direction, and, and all this stuff unfolds. Now, um, there's an ongoing continuity to my life that has never stopped, um, has never stopped being clearer and clearer. Uh, pure consciousness has not stopped um, unfolding from within itself and become 
a greater and greater silence. Mm -hmm. or, and I don't usually u even like using the word silence beca because it, silence, pure unbounded silence isn't even an experience. The, you could say that's a nothing state. How do you experience nothing? By the time you have an experience, there's something happening. Mm -hmm. Pure consciousness is, there's, there's something happening. That something happening is the movement of consciousness on the subtlest level. That subtlest level is um, enjoyable. The subtlest level percolates into the uh, subtle relative, percolates into the gross relative. It's one continuum of experience. And, and it keeps unfolding. I mean, for instance, um, think of think of you know, I can't I can't immediately go to Mars and see where or or any planet and, and see the what's going on there, right? Mm -hmm. So that's an unknown. Right. Pure consciousness is kind of like that. Every time you something unfolds, it also unfolds a whole field that you haven't seen before. Mm -hmm. There's always more. It's enjoyable. It's just as enjoyable as going to the grocery store or eating good food or having a relationship with somebody or your family. Knowledge becomes the enjoyment aspect of your life. So more unfolds from within itself. You say, oh, that's pretty cool. And so more unfolds. There's, and every time more unfolds, there's a bigger puzzle. And as it unfolds, it, it's, it's still pure consciousness, right? I it's mean, absolutely. It's not like something has kind of split off from pure consciousness and become non-pure consciousness. It's, and it's still the it's, ocean. It's still the ocean. It's just like a new, you're, you're, to get back to the metaphor we used at the very beginning of the interview, you're just, you've discovered some new little coral reef to explore in, in the same ocean that you are, and, it, and that coral reef is contained within you, it always has been, it's just that you hadn't really tuned in on it, you know, and oh, now, now it's here, let me get my scuba gear and, and explore this reef, because it's part of me. Let's bring it even closer to home, like okay. what I'm doing right now. Uh -huh. That's, this is one of the fish in the ocean, me talking. Right. Otherwise, why am I talking? Yeah. I, mean, I enjoy it, I want to share it, you enjoy it, you want to share it, mm -hmm. that's one of the fish in the ocean. Yeah. <laughs> why should I stop? Yeah. Why should I stop? Right. And why should why should not more and more people get it? Why not? Why? That's what it's all about. Now, to say that you don't have to do anything, go ahead and do nothing then. Don't talk about me. Don't make comments about me if there's nothing to do. Don't. Leave me alone. <laughs> and, 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 you know, you don't have to believe me. That's okay. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, the reason we go forward is because there's more to go forward to. It doesn't matter how awake you are. Mm. Why do all the gurus open their mouths and have people? I'm not a guru. I just have an experience that I'm wanting to relate. And uh, I enjoy relating it now. Yeah. I didn't enjoy it as much in the past. I do now. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's kind of what I do. And, um, and I think the person who's asking these questions has, a very, has the same fundamental motivation, I see. which is to share knowledge, to clarify people's misunderstanding, to prevent people from getting deluded or sidetracked or something. And you know, she has her take on um, how things are. And it contrasts with your take on how things are. And I would love to be able to sit you down with such people and, uh, and have you hash it out, and rather than me trying to play middleman. But it's not working that way. But it actually does you know, provide a, a stimulus for bringing out more information. You know, if you, it if, does, if, yeah. if you just all took questions that were all, were all just entirely in, in tune with your viewpoint, there would be certain areas that that wouldn't come out. Yeah, that wouldn't come out, and certain people who would be left out of the discussion because their view viewpoint wouldn't be taken into consideration. Well, there is. I agree, but it isn't just this one person. There's sure, hundreds there's, of. There's people. whole. She represents a whole niche. Of, An entire of, niche. Of, and uh, there's other niches of um, of the what the, the silence people. <laughs> there's that, and I mean the Hare Krishna people are going to hear you one way, and the Christians are going to hear you another way, and say you're going to hell. I mean, there's all these people with different perspectives, and you know, I agree with that. But the people you're going to help are the people who are receptive. It's always like that. And and she, this lady, um, can help the people who are receptive to her. Yeah. Right. And. Uh, I don't and, think and having you answer her questions can help people too okay. because 
if there are people, because there, as you say, there's a whole subcategory, there's a whole niche of people who think a certain way. And personally, what, me as an interviewer, I have a great, I'm in a great position because I, I get exposed to a different perspective every week. And nobody can blame you. <laughs> yeah. So I love kind of like, uh, you know, having uh, this flavor and this flavor and this flavor and, and just kind of like exploring all these different perspectives. And personally, I think that's a healthy thing. And so, I don't know, I, if you kind of like, it's like the Democrats and Republicans. The, the, the Democrats are all watching MSNBC. The Republicans are all watching Fox News. So they're they're each in their own bubble, and they don't really kind of like there's there's a, they don't mix much. Yeah, they, there's a divide. They don't mix. They're they're kind of there's a gulf between them. So it's kind of useful, I think, to especially in the spiritual world to mix it up and to explore different perspectives and and use that as a way of just like what you're saying, exploring. Uh, well, I do broadening the range no, of hang your experience. On. I ex I accept their experience. Mm -hmm. They don't accept mine. I expect the f I totally um, respect the fact that they're talking about pure consciousness. I have that same experience. Mm -hmm. uh, even if I wasn't having the experience that I say I'm having, intellectually, I would hedge my bets and say that everything is included. <laughs> yeah. Uh, rather than nothing is included. Yeah. I'd hedge my bets and say, God is there, the angels are there, the devas are there, the relative is there, and it's all good. Well, it's that's kind of what I'm doing, because I don't experience all those things, yeah. but in, intuitively, I, yeah, makes such sense to me. Yes. Uh, and intellectually also, yes. I mean, just understanding how creation works, it's got to sort of be this way, that uh, it's almost, I can almost taste it, you know, even though I don't experience it. So, and, and yes, I, d I d I'm not fond of the word illusion, even though it describes a certain state of consciousness, mm -hmm. and, and it's and it's clear that um, that elusive quality of the relative is there up until you understand and see it in the self. Yeah. If you can a imagine for one moment, if if your eyes and your ears are seeing the subtle relative, and there's no gap between. The fluctuations of the si most silent level that is possible for human consciousness, or my consciousness, let's say, to experience, and there's no gap between those fluctuations and the subtle relative, the divine relative, and no gap between the divine relative and the gross, so called gross relative. What if there was no gap? If you could see that as a continuum, mm -hmm. what would you say that all was? I say it's all consciousness, I say it's all a continuum because that's how I see it, that's how I know it, that's mm. how I hear it. Um, even intellectually, I can conceive of a state where there's only, only unbounded stillness. Right. Now, that unbounded stillness, this is interesting, is, does permeate the subtle relative, does permeate the gross relative. Mm -hmm. So it is all unbounded silence on immovable silence. By immovable, it looks immovable. Hmm. There is a state, there is a state of nothingness, but you don't have that experience. You kind of intuit that there's this vacuum state somewhere. There's no experience there. By the time you have an experience, there's already, let's call that uh, pure intelligence or pure consciousness. Hmm. You, it's a self-knowing field. It's kind of a warmed up. Warmed up, yeah. yeah, that's a good way to put it. And that warmed up feel, you can see what what it is you can actually see it you can hear it you can even touch it and the reason you can have a sensory experience of pure consciousness is because it's your experience ultimately ultimately it's your it's your personal experience how can the absolute be personal well it can be personal because it's an experience mm. if it wasn't an experience you couldn't have it since it is an experience, somebody's having it. That somebody is ultimately seen as a, a physiology as well, ultimately. And as soon as there's a connection to God and the subtle levels, you begin to see it on a more cosmic level. But the individual, the I-ness of the individual is still there and is rediscovered. Mm. Maybe, maybe, maybe people lose that I-ness, you know, um, in some states of consciousness, but it's regained. It's regained. Um, if the state of immortality exists, then somebody has to have that state. Otherwise, it's not immortality. Otherwise, it doesn't exist, I it guess. Does, otherwise, it doesn't exist. If you just merge into the absolute,
then that's the same as death. Hmm. Now, if consciousness survives, then something survives. What is that something that survives? The, the individual who is cosmic, the individual who is unbounded, in the individual, the person, the I-ness of pure, the, the I-ness of consciousness. That's kind of interesting because the, because the experience of pure consciousness, the experience of the I at a certain point is universal. It's everywhere. The I is everywhere. Now, to recognize that I as universal and personal at the same time, that's the trick. That's the trick of awareness. That's mm. the trick of enlightenment. They're there together. There's no difference between the unbounded eye and the and the personal eye. They're the same thing, but they're there together. They exist together, and that togetherness of the eye. The eye is everywhere, but the eye is still focused at the center of the wheel, the hub of the wheel. Mm. So, let's say consciousness starts expanding from this center and goes on all these directions. If the I-ness of the pure consciousness of that first initial experience is seen as the self, and it doesn't, it doesn't lose itself in the pieces, let's say that all the pieces of consciousness join each other. They're like a web, right? Mm -hmm. So the web can get as big as you like, but because all the points in the web are joined, they continue to be pure consciousness. They continue to be wholeness. As a matter of fact, the more of these points, the more of these layers, the more of these uh, even relative phenomena ultimately that you experience, the more they reveal the self, the nowhere. The more they reveal even the silence. It's kind the of world reveals Brahman. The world reveals. that saying? Yeah. 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 Huh. Cool. Well, that was a little far out and abstract for some people, maybe, but it might be a good stopping point. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So, this is good. Um, I, just get, I guess I'll just make some concluding remarks. and um, You probably don't have any final comments, because that was a good one, but if you want to, you can... Okay, I'll, I'll make uh, just one sure. comment, you know. I do tend to go out there sometimes with... Um, well, that's good stuff. I mean, and I could start probing you on that and but, all, but, but, you know. You know, everything in pure consciousness, everything on these levels, everything has a practical day-to-day. Uh, -day. The story of my life, my daily life, is the same story as it is on the subtle level. Mm -hmm. It's the same story that is on the absolute. It's one story. And everybody has that story. Everybody has that connectedness. Everybody is... Uh, the totality of a consciousness. I know that sounds out mm -hmm. there, but totality is a simple state. It's not a complicated state. Pure consciousness is a simple state. Mm -hmm. The subtle relative and the gross relative all tied together. It becomes knowable and becomes simple. It doesn't become more complicated because everything is revealed. No one aspect of consciousness hides any other aspect of consciousness. And if it doesn't hide it, it becomes clear and simple. Yeah. There we go. Well, for most people, there's plenty of hiding taking place, you know, many of many layers of obscuration. And so for most people, this will be a long term for everyone. I'd say it'll be a long term exploration, never ending exploration. And, uh, you know, um, it's hard to say exactly where any one person is on the whole, you know, it's almost impossible. Yeah. yeah. But wherever one happens to be. Keep on trucking. Keep you know? on trucking. Because <laughs> there's yet more to explore. Well, I'd like to thank you for having me again. It's great. Sure. I enjoyed it. And mm -hmm. and we'll do it again someday. Yep. Okay. It'll be interesting when your book comes out. I bet you it'll sell well. Yeah. So uh, I'll make a few concluding remarks. So I've been interviewing Harry Alto. Um, Harry and I live in the same town, as you can tell. And uh, this interview has been one in an ongoing series. There are about 240 of them or so now. Um, you can uh, watch them all, not watch them all, but you can <laughs> investigate to see what ones there might be to watch by going to batgap.com, B-A-T-G-A-P, 
and uh, there you will find under the past interviews menu you'll find uh, an alphabetical index, a chronological index, and a uh, topical index, uh, and, uh, categorical, uh, which we're doing our best to sort out. Uh, there's also on future interviews menu, there's a, a list of upcoming interviews. And there's also a page to suggest a guest if you'd like to suggest someone to be interviewed. Um, there on the site you'll also find uh, a donate button, which I appreciate people clicking and need people to click uh, as, if they can to keep this whole thing going and expand it. Uh, there is a chat group which gets quite lively sometimes around each interview. Each interview has its own theme in the chat group. There is a link to an audio podcast, so you can listen to this, uh, you know, just in audio while you're driving or whatever. And there is a link to sign up to be notified by email each time a new interview is posted. And some other stuff too if you explore around. So thank you for listening and, or watching and we'll see you next week with I believe David Hoffmeister I think his name is. I think he's a Course in Miracles guy so we'll talk about that. Okay thanks. Thank you Harry. Thank you. It's great. Yep.